<coughs> Hi folks, hope everybody's okay. Uh, love to everybody out there. We are looking at uh, Jesus and the eyewitnesses. Um, and we're looking at uh, Dr. Borkham's scholarship. I don't agree with everything about Dr. Borkham, but um, it's important uh, the work that he's done because um, he did a book in 2006 which has been part of a revolution in New Testament studies. The scholarly academic world has realized that actually the Gospels Matthew, Mark, Luke and John have actual eyewitness material within it and that's revolutionized the scholarship so I'd like us to look at the book now I'm very tired uh, I've had the builders in the house uh, and I'm quite tired um, uh, so I don't know how long this video is going to be but I'll try my best uh, to do it as long as I can and uh, look over as much of the scholarship as I can um, as I've said before, nobody has a right to copy this video, only uh, Christians who are working for a church uh, can use this video. It's on normal YouTube license and nobody, I repeat, nobody else has a right to copy this video. There is an atheist channel uh, that claims to be my archive channel. They are not my archive channel. They have no right to have the videos that they have been uploading. Um, I, I did give people permission to copy them, but the atheists went and uh, and been cheeky and used a thousand five hundred of my videos. Um, and I put my videos at that time on Commons license, but now they're on normal YouTube license and unless I give you specific permission you may not copy it so if you see this video on an atheist channel then I would ask you to flag them because what they're doing is wrong they have no permission I repeat they have no permission to use this video okay and um, the horrendous persecution that the atheists have done to me um, I had 2,000 scholarly videos I was threatened by these atheists and I had to get rid of those 2,000 scholarly videos and I have absolutely had a horrendous time with the internet atheist in the cyberbullying persecution and all the rest of it um, they have tried to stop me having doing scholarly work on YouTube and um, I'm not going to be put off I'll continue to do my my work but you need to realize I'm just telling you what the atheists have been doing and continue to do you will see videos that the atheists have collected of mine that are just silly and foolish and having a bit of laugh and um, things like that and they have put those videos on a channel but you will not find my scholarly videos or as many I've started to make a new batch now but you will not find two, the 2000 videos that I made prior to 2013 the reason is because the atheists got rid of them so they have tried to discredit me and they are a wicked evil movement on the internet they're involved in cyberbullying they have YouTube channels and blog shows and major atheist leaders are involved in it and it's despicable and they have really 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 persecuted me but I'm not going to let them stop me from getting on <coughs> so I'm not going to mention them again as in I've said that before but I say it again I, I don't want to get involved with these atheists but from time to time I will mention what they did to me and that what they did to me was a disgrace and they continue to do it to me, they continue to attack me and I'm not bothering with them, I don't have a channel on atheism uh, well I have, I have two small channels with about a handful of videos but I don't have a channel, a major channel 
with 2,000 videos that I used to have um, critiquing atheism because if I did the atheists would harass me like they have been doing so there we are so I would just ask the atheists to stop your harassment I pleaded with their major leaders I absolutely begged them they wouldn't listen they wouldn't help um, and they they made my life a misery they they really really made made my life an absolute misery and they're cocky at the moment they're running around YouTube thinking they run YouTube they're cocky they think they're smart because they're but the their bullying tactics they can get away with it I hope one day that somebody will teach these atheists a lesson on YouTube I hope some smart Alec Christian or atheist teaches these atheists that have persecuted me a lesson I hope YouTube teaches these atheists a lesson I hope someone somewhere investigates these atheists and teaches them a lesson because what they did to me was an absolute disgrace they've got thousands of my videos now and got rid of thousands of my videos so they saved the videos that they wanted to use to try and discredit me and got rid of 2,000 videos that's the kind of nonsense these people are involved in and even now I don't bother with these people even now they still do shows attacking me still do shows where they're uploading videos and they're horrible they're just a nasty piece of, piece of work and that's the major leaders as well and they go on these shows and they have these nice intellectual discussions but nobody realizes what goes on behind the scenes how these people are manipulative and nasty and how they assassinate people and don't allow them to do the scholarship that's the the unseen world of this internet atheism that you don't see and that's what goes on so enough of that but I will from time to time just mention a little bit but I'm not going to go on and on and on about it okay so let's forget about that so like I said if someone could do something about it I'd be very grateful if someone could uh, teach these atheists a lesson who were bullies cyber bullies I don't know how you can do that but um, it's not something I want to get involved in. I don't want to get involved with them because uh, they've they've phoned and threatened me and stuff like that. So, <coughs> okay. This is what we're doing today. This is what we're doing. Jesus and the eyewitness. Okay. We're going to look at this book, we're going to look at this scholar, and uh, we're going to have a good time looking at that. I hope you enjoy it. Okay, uh, sorry about this. This is the scholar that we're looking at. So I'll just play a bit of this for you. The standard scholarly view of how the traditions about Jesus reach the evangelists when they were writing their gospels is the view that formed criticism proposed early in the 20th century. And the view is that the eyewitnesses who heard Jesus speak and saw the events of his life presumably started the traditions off. But then there began a whole process of these traditions passing through
might be different ways of reading it. Managed to read it in a very conservative way, as though the tradition preserved the traditions pretty well. Um, but the form critics um, and the real disciples of the form critics tend not to think that because they stress that the communities and the oral tradition were not really interested in history. So they have no real motive for preserving traditions about Jesus accurately. Their motives are much more to adapt and add to and kind of create freely uh, traditions about Jesus um, and add them to the traditions. And, and that's why on the form critical view, you need, if you are going to say something about the historical Jesus, you need criteria to distinguish authentic material in the Gospels from inauthentic material. Um, and that's the way a whole lot of Gospel scholarship has gone. It's been very widely agreed now, I think, that the Gospels were biographies in the sense of ancient biography. Um, this has been debated, but that becoming the prevailing view, I think. Um, not in the sense of modern biographies, of course. We have to rule out all kinds of things that modern biographers do. Um, the kinds of things an ancient biographer did uh, are what are appropriate to the Gospels. But further than that, I think we have to see them as contemporary biographies in the sense they were written while there were still eyewitnesses around. Um, and this is extremely important because the way the ancients thought about history, writing of history, is that you could only write good history um, within living memory of the events. Um, and they distinguished real history in that sense. Real history has to be contemporary history. Um, and it's because they didn't have uh, all the kinds of archives and all the kinds of uh, sources and, and, and so forth uh, that modern historians have. And what mattered for them is that they themselves either had been a participant in the events themselves, and that, of course, was the best thing of all, or alternatively, they'd, they'd actually been able to interview uh, eyewitnesses of the events. So the Gospels, I think, fit within that category um, that people would expect to be good history. They would expect it to be reliant on eyewitnesses. And they would, I think, be alert to indications in the Gospels of what the eyewitness sources of those Gospels were. The form critics um, regarded... The so that's just uh, to get a look at uh, Dr. Borkum and now we're just going to listen to a debate between an atheist and Dr. Borkum. The atheist is from Sheffield University. It's uh, James Crosley. And we're just going to listen to uh, a few minutes discussion between Richard J. Borkum and J James J. Crosley, because it'll be an eye-opener. Uh, what you'll find in this discussion is that this, the atheist guy is a really fair, honest intellectual. And you'll hear him um, say how he feels that uh, Borkham's book is worthy of thinking about it and, and, and discussing it, really. Um, so uh, you, you won't get that from many atheists. Um, and I think it's important for you to, to know that. Just from the conservative wing of scholarship. I know one or two people who aren't from the conservative wing of scholarship who take it seriously. And I think it's uh, it's moved scholarship forward. Well, Richard and James will be joining me again next week as we continue to uncover more about this very important book Just, uh, in his last week, because that's the only place where his Jesus is in Jerusalem. Now, John, you see, one of the things about John that's very striking, actually, is that John is very precise about chronology and geography. You always know in John pretty closely at what point in, in the two-year ministry uh, something happens because he ties things to the Jewish feasts. Uh, you always know pretty, pretty definitely where they happen, which is much, much vaguer very often in the synoptics. John has this precision about history and geography, uh, which makes me actually more inclined to, to, to um, credit John. And I'm not alone in this. I mean, I think quite a few people think that actually, if one's simply looking at general probability, it's much more likely that Jesus went to Jerusalem several times during his ministry than that he didn't go near the place until the last week. But the point I really wanted to make about what led to the death of Jesus is, you see, I think John portrays the cleansing of the temple as the beginning of this process of antagonizing uh, the Jewish authorities in Jerusalem um, that eventually leads up to to uh, Jesus' death. So, in a sense, the cleansing of the temple is a trigger 
even in John's narrative. Um, whereas what Mark does is condense that whole process that John has taking place over several visits to Jerusalem, that antagonism of the authorities to Jesus has to all kind of build up within one week. Um, uh, but I think actually they, they both give the cleansing of the temple an important role in that. Well, join us again in a couple of moments' time when we'll hear from James again and start to wrap up this section of the programme. Well, if you've enjoyed the programme today as I have, you'll want to tune next week as uh, James and Richard join me again to continue to discuss Jesus and the eyewitnesses. So much more to uncover in this book. Specifically, we'll be looking at the testimony of eyewitnesses, how far that can be trusted in itself, um, given Richard's belief that it was, if you like, the testimony of eyewitnesses that was recorded in the Gospels. Uh, so join us for that as we continue to look into this subject. Let's get back into our discussion as we start to wind up our programme for today. You're listening to Unbelievable on Premier Christian Radio. So, James, does Richard's explanation of the differences between John and the synoptics, and particularly Mark, work for you? Give, giving a plausible reason why it, it could still be eyewitness testimony, even though it differs significantly from Mark, which, you know, it, it, essentially what you're saying is John got it, his, you know, in terms of um, historically correct, because Mark wasn't so interested in getting everything in its perfect order. He wanted to put everything that happened in one place together in, in one one bit of the story. I mean, I mean, it stretches out a little bit too much for me, I think. I mean, I still think there is a, a element of a good chronology in Mark's Gospel, especially the idea of the last week in Jerusalem where he does something in the temple and he ends up being crucified. It seems, you know, a fairly obvious running events to me. It's the... Again, though, I mean, I mean, I, I agree that the placing of the uh, cleansing of the temple at the beginning of Jesus' ministry in John has this narrative function. Um, but then the Lazarus story, what, I mean, how would you bring that into the death then? Because it does seem to be too, still too stark ways of explaining the death of Jesus in, in Jerusalem. Two contradictory ways, is what you're saying. I, I, would, I would probably have to go that far, yes. I mean, I guess Richard wouldn't. Well, I'm suggesting the cleansing of the temple is the initial clash with the Jewish authorities, which then builds up over Jesus' visits to Jerusalem. Um, and of course, John has a last week in Jerusalem, but the, Lazar, the right, raising, of Lazar, raising of Lazarus, because you see, John's account, the raising of Lazarus, not surprisingly, has a huge effect on Jesus' popularity with the crowds. So it, it's a kind of the trigger to this very dangerous popularity of Jesus at the, at the end, which you also get reference to in the synoptics, you know, this the sense that Jesus was a troublemaker. He's, he's, they've got to do something about him because, you know, they have a rebellion on their hands, something like that. So that I, I think the Lazarus event has that effect in John's narrative um, and therefore acts as the sort of final point when they must resolve to, to really take action. And John, of course, has this meeting of the High Priest's Council after Lazarus' resurrection. Um, now, the synoptics also have that meeting. Um, but they don't have Lazarus as, as a kind of trigger for it. Just time to wrap up, really, uh, as we conclude this section of the programme, um, with some final thoughts. Uh, though we, It's been fascinating going through the, the various sort of differing points and also the points of you know agreement between you gentlemen. Um, I mean, ultimately, when it comes to the authorship of the Gospels as a whole, um, it sounds to me, James, that, that you're not disinclined to agree with uh, with Richard that actually we needn't be as sceptical as some have been in in your field uh, in the past. That, that that there might be good reasons that Richard's putting forward here for for accepting that actually yes, it, that these were eyewitness accounts that that have been transmitted reasonably. Uh, accurately. Yeah, I mean, I may dis you know, um, be a little uh, agnostic on issues of authorship of Mark, say, and maybe I don't buy the idea of the authorship of John. Uh, but yes, I mean, I, I've, I think I think the general overall model is a plausible one, particularly with reference to the Synoptic Gospels. Um, I think there's lots of there's arguments I kind of generally buy, even if I, you know, be a little uh, skeptical on you know absolute precision. But I think it's an important model. Uh, I hope people will take it seriously, not just from the conservative wing of scholarship. I know one or two people who aren't from the conservative wing of scholarship who take it seriously, and I think it's uh, it's moved scholarship forward. Well, Richard and James will be joining me again next week as we continue to uncover more about this very important book, Jesus.
witnesses and the eyewitnesses. We'll be particularly looking at the uh, testimony of the eyewitnesses and how far that should be trusted. What does it constitute when we talk about the testimony of an eyewitness in ancient times? Um, particularly, we'll be looking at the eyewitness of uh, people like the women at the tomb uh, in regards to the resurrection. Whether eyewitness accounts of miracles count as eyewitness testimony and that sort of thing. So it'll be a really interesting program as we uh, conclude this uh, study, this look into Jesus and the eyewitnesses. Don't forget if you go to the up. So there we are. Um, so we, what we'll do is from time to time we'll, we'll be looking at clips of Barkham and his discussions with scholars and uh, we'll be looking a bit more of this one. Uh, well, that, the reason why I showed you this is James G. Uh, Crosley is an atheist and he's a more balanced atheist scholar and takes Dr. Richard J. Bockham's work very seriously where most of the internet atheists and the inter uh, atheist scholars such as Richard Carrier and people like that don't take Bockham seriously and it's because they have fringe scholarship um, but now we're going to get into a bit of meat and uh, we're going to be looking at this paper now. This is a, a paper by uh, Dr. Borkham and uh, we're going to be looking at a few papers, a few of his books, a few of his ideas. Um, so this is uh, off Dr. Richard's Dr. Richard Borkham's uh, paper, 12 pages, on um, the authenticity of eyewitness in the New Testament. So I'll read some of it. Um, you can see it there being read, so you can follow the reading. So we're going to look at quite a few academic papers tonight. Uh, and. Uh, I'll try my best, I'm really tired, um, but let's, let's go. Bochum says, I was asked to speak to you on the authenticity of apostolic witness in the New Testament. And clearly this was an invitation to share with you some of the content of my book, Jesus and the Witnesses. This is the book that we're looking at, which I know some of you have read. It's a big book, and so of course I shall merely pick out some key themes. But I thought that particular title might also suggest that I start in a different place from where I did in the book. And to look briefly at the way in which apostolic eyewitness functioned as a criterion of authenticity in the period from the 2nd to the 3rd centuries, when mainstream Christianity was sorting out what we call the canon of the four gospels, by which I mean an authoritative collection of four gospels. No more, no less, the four Gospels we have in our New Testament as authoritative scripture for the Church. This was a crucial process that, in a sense, was early mainstream Christianity's way of defining itself. It meant that to be a Christian was to believe in the Jesus to which these four Gospel witnesses, and that, of course, remained the case throughout all the subsequent history of the Church. And basically, I think the more radical New Testament scholarship of recent years has not succeeded in changing it. It matters very much for Christian faith that these four Gospels are, in a sense, the early church, since the early church meant, which I have still to define, authentic, authentically apostolic. So we'll read the next section and then I'll, I'll, I'll do some thoughts about what he said. The four Gospels we have in the New Testament were, I think, already from the time that they had begun to circulate around the various local communities of the early Christian movement regarding as apostolic in the sense of being soundly based upon the testimony of those disciples of Jesus who had been close to him throughout the events of the ministry, death and resurrection of Jesus. But by the later second century at least there was were lots of gospels around and most of them claimed to be apostolic bearing the name not only of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John but also of Thomas, Philip, James, Mary and others. How did the mainstream church's four gospel canon emerge from that plethora of candidates for authoritative gospel status? There were, after all, several possibilities. The church could have opted for just one gospel as one leader of a Christian sectarian group. Marcion did, choosing Luke and carefully edited it.
diatessaron of Tatian was actually produced in the late second century. Thirdly, of course, more than four Gospels could have been accepted as authentic. The option some of the Gnostic group took, sorry, the option some of the Gnostic group took. It wasn't necessarily obvious that the outcome of whatever process of debate and discernment went on should be a canon of precisely these four Gospels. The principal criterion of Gospel canonicity that operated in this process of discernment was evidently apostolicity. The elevation of these four Gospels into a canon, an exclusive position rested on the claim that all four of these Gospels are apostolic and that only these four are apostolic. I'll explain in a moment more carefully what was meant by apostolic in this context, but it's worth noting, noticing first how how that term served to gather the attention of the four Gospels as such, as well as to rule out others that were deemed to be not authentically apost apostolic. Just to provide all here, um, I'll just stop reading. Um, you know, some of you might say, well, why have we got all these Gospels, uh, these various Gnostic Gospels? I've said this before, but I've read the Gnostic Gospels, and when you line them up to the four Gospels, it's obvious that most of them refer to the four Gospels, so they see the Gospels, four Gospels as authoritative. And secondly, that when you look at the historical information in these Gospels, they're very terse, apart, except for the later ones which are taken a lot from the Book of Acts. But they're very terse in the historical statements. So for example, I've said this before, if you look at uh, the Gnostic Gospels and how much they comment on Jerusalem, there is about 30 comments. and the very nebulous and vague comment Jerusalem. Yet if you look at the Gospels, four Gospels, there are at least 70 comments about Jerusalem. And those comments are often very detailed. And so you find that the Gospel writers know the period of Jesus' time and know it historically and accurately well. Whereas the Gnostic Gospels are very vague and nebulous and it's obviously that, that they are late pieces of literature and not authentic eyewitness material. That's just a provider. So we'll continue with uh, Borkham. Because nearly all of the content of Mark is also to be found in Matthew and Luke, it's easy to appreciate that people should have neglected Mark's gospel and preferred the more comprehensive gospels, but Mark's gospel was believed to derive quite closely from the testimony of Peter. And so return its place, retained its place among the four gospels because it was apostolic. The criteria of apostolicity also, I think, prevented the church opting for something like Tatian's diatessaron, a combination of the contents of all four Gospels woven together as a single narrative. This must have been, a, must have been an attractive option, but was not, by and large, taken because it was the four Gospels as such that were regarded as apostolic. The sense was doubtless that they came from the apostolic age and should not be superseded even by a new gospel compiled entirely from their contents. So, now what was meant by apostolicity, apostolicity, sorry, apostolicity? This notion is used by such authors as Irenaeus and the so-called Moratorian Canon comprises three aspects. There was an important chronological aspect. Apostolic Gospels must derive from the apostolic age, which the Fathers thought of as ending 100 AD, when the last of the four Gospel Johns was believed to have been written. So we find, for example, that the Moratorian Canon disqualified, disqualifies from canonicity a work known as the Shepherd of Hermes, Hermes, a book by an early Christian prophet. The author of the Moratorian text actually recommends the Shepherd of Hermes for reading. He regards it as orthodox and valuable, but he does not think it should be read publicly in, ch in church worship because of its post-apostolic date. Now that's not a case of a gospel, but even more so, would the issue of date of origin apply in the case of gospels? Apostolic gospels come from the circle of the apostles of Jesus. This narrow criterion, not only from the apostolic period, but from the circle of whom 
Jesus himself gave authority to preach the Christian message, not just incidentally the twelve, but all of those Jesus had commissioned. The apostles were those who could be relied on to know what the true gospel was. I've said from the circle of the apostles because Irenaeus and others like him did not think Mark and Luke were themselves personal disciples of Jesus. But their gospels qualified because they were in close touch with the apostles. So we need to take apostolic authorship too strictly. Sorry, so we need not take apostolic authorship too strictly. It means rather more broadly those who were really in a position to know what those who had been close to Jesus taught. Apostolicity implies conformity with the mainstream church tradition of teaching. Therefore, even if one could not otherwise determine the historical origin of a gospel ascribed to Thomas of Mary, the means of doing so were of various quite limited, were of course quite limited. One could still tell from its teaching whether it was authentically apostolic. This aspect is important and deserves more discussion, but for our purpose now, I just want to stress the point that apostolic doctrine was not enough. Gospel authenticity required also the personal link with actual apostles, personal disciples of Jesus. So I think what a lot of uh, Borkham's work does is he shows this thesis that the fact that the Gospels are connected to the Apostles in various ways are significant and important and it shows in the tradition how that's the case. We go on. To validate the four Gospels canon as apostolic in the sense the early church intended one really has to give some credence both to the titles of the Gospels and to the early patristic testimonies to the origin of the Gospels both of which indicate the Gospels are close connection with apostolic eyewitness themselves, whether or not any of the Gospels was actually written by such an eyewitness. Such a view of the Gospels has become unusual in Gospel scholarship, but this was not always the case in modern New Testament scholarship. What has been overwhelmingly responsible for the discrediting such a view of the Gospels is undoubtedly the approach and understanding the Gospels and their origins and the approach known as, known as form criticism pioneered by Rudolf Bolton and Martin de Debellius around 1920. Form criticism had the effect of radically disassociating the Gospels from the eyewitnesses, so any attempt to reinstate the apostolic eyewitnesses as important to the origin and character of the Gospels must, must engage with form criticism, as I did in my book. Form criticism are I think should now be recognized under mis mentally mis misleading approach to the study of the Gospels. We need to cut loose from its continuing if waning influence and establish a different approach. So he's going to go into the fall criticism and he might say things that I'm going to say but fall criticism by Rudolf Bultmann. Rudolf Bultmann was influenced by existential philosophy. He believed that there was no possibility of the supernatural breaking into our world and for us knowing it. So he had what is called demythologizing, which means strip away the mythological elements and get back to the true gospel. Uh, this effect, uh, the other issue was that there was a historical criterion that they had in the form critics, and that was anything first century Jewish must be disregarded as as not being historical, uh, only material in the Gospels that is influenced by the Greeks is truly authentic. This was disastrous. This is these are my own thoughts now, not Borkham's. This was di disastrous for scholarship because the criteria of not taking the Jewish context seriously is obviously going to mean that you're going to leave out vast quantities of evidence that need to be sifted and collated. Thank goodness that this has changed but it has been a disastrous methodology. We come back to Barkham. Absolutely fundamental for the form critics approach to the Gospels was their conviction that the Gospels are folk literature which they compared with the material studied by the folklorist of their day. It was axiomatic for them that this type of oral tradition was formed and transmitted by the four, not by individuals, and that the communities that 
valued such folklore had not of any kind in history. The Jesus traditions they held by analogy were anonymous community traditions passed down in the early Christian communities, not connected to individuals such as those who had been eyewitnesses of Jesus' history, but only to the continued community itself. They were transmitted not by people concerned to relate past history, but for purposes orientated solely to the community's present, and could therefore be freely modified or even created de novo in accordance with the community's present needs. I want to unpack this because this is really important. You might not realize the significance here, but it's very significant and important. The, what the folk critics did is they took folklore um, uh, folk, sort of folklore literature and they analyzed it and then they made conclusions from studying that what the gospels uh, how the gospels would have been written. The problem is that these folk literature that they took were often Scandinavian folk literature and here's the problem Scandinavian folk literature is not the same as first century literature. Scandinavian oral tradition is not the same as first century oral tradition or Jewish rabbinic oral tradition. That was the massive mistake again that the form critics made. You see recent research done by um, James Dunn in Jesus Remembered has come to the conclusion that when we're actually talking about oral tradition we have to make sure that the oral tradition is in its historical context of that particular culture because different cultures used oral tradition in different ways so that was the second problem of folk critics the second the, uh, sorry the first problem the second problem is um, just get my thoughts I'm a little bit tired is the issue about individuals and communities and oral tradition. Again, because they're using the Scandinavian model of oral tradition in folk literature, they came to the conclusion that oral tradition was passed on by communities, but individuals were not significant. But if you go to first century rabbinic Judaism, that's precisely not the way oral tradition works. It works by key leaders or key religious leaders or key philosophers and their students would learn what they had to say and pass it on. Individuals were significant and individuals connected to the individuals whose teaching they were trying to transmit were significant. So we go back to Borkham now. Working on these assumptions, the four critics attempted to classify the various forms in which the individual units of Jesus' tradition were cast and to relate each form to a particular function it would have fulfilled in the early communities. Closely associated was the notion of tradition history, utilizing supposed laws of the tradition, standard ways in which the traditions were held to have developed, and the assumptions that each tradition originally existed in pure form, unlike the mixed and anomalous forms that are found in the Gospels, it was supposed possible to trace the history of a tradition back from the Gospels to a reconstructed original or at least the form of the tradition back from the Gospels to a reconstructed original or at least a form of the traditional tradition earlier than the preserved in any of the Gospels. In this way the text of the Gospels were put at a considerable distance from the beginnings of the Gospel tradition highly creative developments could be postulated. However, tradition history as such could scarcely be a tool for reaching back to the historical Jesus himself, since there could be no guarantee that even the reconstructed early versions of traditions had anything to do with the historical Jesus. The communities, after all, had no concern with the authenticity or history. For scholars unwilling to give up the quest for the historical Jesus, therefore, a famous criterion of authenticity became necessary. The fact such criteria are usually applied individually to each unit of Jesus' tradition in the context of a skeptical view of the historical value of the gospel tradition as a whole follows directly from the form critical view of the oral tradition. Since the search for authentic historical Jesus material 
runs against the grain of the oral tradition itself, the only way to proceed was to operate extremely rigorous criteria designed to rescue isolated bits of authentic tradition. So we'll, we'll just have a break there and we'll come back um, to this in a minute and um, we'll have a little bit of this discussion and we'll read a bit more of the essay. Unbelievable web page. You can find out more about getting hold of the as they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. So um, a, a variety of responses to that whole issue of predestination and Calvinism. Um, we broadcast that program in a sense to mark the 500th anniversary of the birth of John Calvin. But we moved on to a different topic in our session program between Jane White and the Forsters. Again, a Christian discussion, if you like, uh, two different interpretations of hell. James White was defending an eternal conscious torment view of hell. Jesus and the eyewitnesses has shaken up the world of um, biblical criticism um, as he makes a very strong case for the Gospels being eyewitness testimony. Um, and he even goes so far as to uh, make claims of who those eyewitnesses were. In fact, makes the quite audacious claim in many ways that the Gospel of John, the last book many would consider to be able to nail down a, uh, as an eyewitness account, uh, as being uh, actually written by an eyewitness, namely John. Uh, so uh, a really interesting discussion we were having last week, gentlemen. We sort of um, got from you your, your basic thesis, Richard. Um, James, you were concerned at some, on some level, you agreed with much, but, mm. but were concerned at um, particularly Richard's claim that John is an eyewitness account. Mm. You, you feel um, that John is just very theologized. It's, it's, um, it's obviously worked out a lot of theology. Um, it feels to you too late to have been written by an eyewitness. Is, is that the, the wouldn't, sense? I wouldn't say too late. I mean, it seems to me that there's some creative uh, writing, up, rewriting, inventing going on with John's Gospel now, whether that's by a community or whether that's by an eyewitness, the, the, the same issue arises, you know, I mean, how reliable is an eyewitness testimony ultimately? Yeah, and, and that's perhaps what we need to discuss today, is the whole concept of eyewitness testimony, which is perhaps what we could look into in today's programme, because, um, I don't know, um, when I hear someone talking about eyewitness testimony, I, I think of a, a courtroom and someone up on the stand and being asked by a barrister to describe what happened as an eyewitness. Um, and then you'll get another eyewitness come along and they might have a slightly different version of events and so the jury will be left to decide who was the most trustworthy, perhaps one of them was under the influence of alcohol when they were describing it or whatever. I mean, um, and, and in many ways your, the book does act as a bit of a detective novel, that's part of the the, the fun of it, I think, Richard, that as you read it, you're sort of trying to get behind, well, why would this eyewitness have said this, and whereas the other eyewitness have said this? Well, maybe this is the reason. You know, we heard a bit of that last week as well. Um, we were talking about the maybe one eyewitness wanted to grant some anonymity to certain people because of the time at which that story was being written down, and they might get into trouble at someone at a later time, and this is your reason for thinking that... I know certain characters in the Gospel of John that are given names, who aren't given names in, in the earlier Gospels. You say that's because um, John was able to kind of let that cat out of the bag at that point. Uh, so really interesting stuff, you know. Um, but, but why should we, I suppose, ultimately trust the eyewitnesses themselves? I mean, um, do, do, could they have been making it up? Could they have got their stories together, you know, and sort of come up with this story about Jesus and his death and resurrection and, and that sort of thing. I mean, that might be where a lot of people's minds will naturally go. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think probably the first important thing to say is that uh, people have asked, well, does it really make any difference if this comes from the eyewitnesses? They, they could get it wrong too, so does it help? I mean, the thing to say about the eyewitnesses is simply that they were in a position to know. I mean, that's, that's the really important thing about the eyewitnesses. They were in a position to know. And, you know, if you think about how you trust people 
who, who um, witness to things? Can't, why do you trust people's testimony? You have to be sure they're in a position to know. You have to have a good idea that they're in a position to know. And if they're not in a position to know, you know, that's a real ground for doubt. So at least they were in a position to. Um, of course, that doesn't mean that they got everything right, um, and absolutely no historical argument could ever uh, prove finally that everything that someone says is, is correct. I did do a lot of work on the psychology of, uh, of eyewitness memory, and there's a whole lot of uh, scientific studies out there which actually nobody has drawn on before in, in relation to Gospels that I think is really quite very interesting stuff. I found it fascinating. Um, and there is a lot of um, study that sort of points to the kinds of things that would be remembered well and how it is that people do remember well when they do. Um, and, and the kinds of things that, that um, are remembered well are unusual events. You don't usually remember your regular day-to-day -day routine. You remember unusual things. Um, things that really were important to you. Things that... So there we are. Um... So we're going to uh, continue to read this article now, and uh, I'll be reflecting uh, on it as well. Criticisms of the form critical paradigm, which I'll begin with criticism relating to the nature of oral tradition in the light of much more plentiful evidence we now have from the study of oral societies. So that's, that's what I've been saying. The early form critics may have used the best model available to them of the nature of oral tradition, but it was a model that cannot be supported now. One very important preliminary point to make is the wide variety found in oral or predominantly oral societies of types, contents, function, means of transmission of oral traditions. That's, that's what I was saying before. Most generalizations are hazardous, and so we should be suspicious of arguments about what must have been true of the gospel tradition on the grounds that that is what oral tradition is. Many features of oral traditions are culturally specific, not usually the same. That's exactly what I said to you before. For example, it is not true that oral tradition is invariably communal rather than being connected with particular individuals who composed and rehearsed traditions. We now realize how important individual tradents are in many oral societies. The traditions are composed, preserved, and performed by individuals who, while operating, of course, in a community context, are the authorities and responsible for the form in which the traditions are known. Another unjustified generalization is that oral societies have no interest in the past and appear to speak of it only as a way of describing the present. Interest in history varies from one oral society to another and the issue must be considered in relation to the particularities of specific cultures. But it is common for all of societies to distinguish factual accounts from fictional tales and to transmit the two differ differently, the former with more regard for faithful reproduction of content and observation important for our purposes is that at least in African oral societies the kind of account that is treated with special care for its faithful reproduction is often that which recounts events within living memory. It has been widely supposed, partly because of the well-known studies of the practice of the South Slavic bards of Milman, Parry and Albert Lord, that oral traditions are normally subject to creative variation from the performance to performance, such variation being fully expected by their audience. But Ruth Finnegan challenges this generalization with the evidence from other societies showing that more or less exact memorization of oral text is also a common pattern, perhaps not over centuries but over shorter times and interestingly for our purposes she observes that one case in which such memorization may be thought particularly important is that of the texts that have a definite religious value or function. An important point about significant variation where it does occur, as of course it frequently does, is that one performance varies from another, but this is not a process of incremental change, such that each stage of tradition builds on the previous one, like a rit literary text edited again and again. This does not mean that there cannot be significant changes over time, but that it is impossible to trace a tradition history back through a series of changes to a punitive original form. 
as the four critics try to do. Perhaps the most important general point for our purpose is that oral societies treat different kinds of tradition differently, expecting faithful reproduction in some cases and creative variation in others. When faithful reproduction is required, such societies have a variety of means at their proposal to ensure it. Whether verbally exact reproduction can be achieved may be doubtful, although it is significant that in some cases this is an attempt, but subsequently substantially faithful reproduction may be both desired and achieved. Methods of ensuring this include both trust entrusting the traditions to authorized even trained guardians and the checking against community memory that will often occur as a tradition is rehearsed. It turns out then that the study of oral tradition in modern oral societies worldwide can see some parameters within which we might expect a particular case such as the Jesus traditions to fall, but permits very little specific determination of what the transmission of the Jesus tradition must have been like. For that we have to consider the specific cultural context which it occurs, the evidence we actually have in the Gospels, that's what I said before. Before we turn to that, there is a more radical and far-reaching criticism to be made of the form critics concept of oral tradition in early Christianity. That at best they applied a model appropriate to transmission of traditions across many generations to a process that occurred within no more than a relatively long lifetime. While the notion of laws of tradition governing the changes that occur over time is dubious in any case, it's certainly not obvious that the same process of change to which folk law transmitted over centuries may be subject are likely to occur over much shorter periods. We have already noticed that some oral societies certainly treat traditions differently if they recount events within living memory, and it is of crucial importance that the Gospels were written within living memory of the events even though the same cases at the least date when this could be true. It means that the gospel writers relationship to the tradition was not that of recorders and users of oral traditions but that of writers of oral history. Modern writers such as Jan Van Sina who are concerned with the way history can be written on the basis of an oral source make a clear distinction between oral tradition and oral history. Tradition formulated and repeated by living eyewitnesses still belong to individual memories which have not yet been su su superseded by collective memory. To a significant extent, it was the writing of the Gospels themselves that made the recollections of eyewitness into the shared memory of the community. In the oral period, since it was the period of living memory, we must reckon with eyewitnesses something the form critics subsequently did not do. And some people find that a bit difficult. It seems to be bringing in an element of subjectivity. Um, but I think there is an important element of subjectivity that, that um, actually the things that really affect you are the things that have gone deep enough into you to stay there. You know? um, so those are the kinds of things that are remembered well. Um, conversely, things that aren't remembered well are, are dates. Very, very rarely, unless it's kind of integral to the story, it's something that happened on your birthday, you remember the date. Otherwise, you don't remember dates of things. Um, and you remember the gist rather than the details. Uh, and I think everybody retelling stories that are important to them, the details will vary over time and to different audiences and so on, but the gist remains constant. What, what do you make of, and this is slightly off at a tangent, so forgive mm -hmm. me, but, but those who, who do want to harmonise the Gospels yes. and, and say, well, you've got this account of the resurrection, you've got this account of the resurrection, and there seem yes. to be differences in the details, yes. but you could see that if so-and-so went on then so-and-so came that would make sense of why they saw something different to so-and-so and and some people um, obviously feel that's important that um, if you're going to believe in the Gospels they have to all be telling exactly the same story mm. others say well look these are just different people's accounts yes. um, no. but does that mean that if there is something that if, if there is an obvious contradiction that therefore someone's got it wrong, does that mean that the Bible is wrong? Is there then a theological implication about that? I mean, what, where, where do you kind of land up on this sort of area? Um, 
Well, I, th I think there are tricky things going on. There are, there are certainly different memories. I mean, I, I think actually there's no real problem about regarding the four accounts of the visit to the empty tomb by the women, in which is a story we have all, all three Gospels, of course. Um, I see no reason why these should not go back to different eyewitnesses telling the story slightly differently. I mean, these were, the, if it happened, it was extraordinary thing to happen, you know, these women whelmed by it, it's not surprising if they tell it slightly differently. There's also a question of storytelling, uh, and you know, one thing that happens is that John uh, tells the story, and he only has Mary Magdalene, he kind of individualizes it, and that's good storytelling. I mean, if you focus on an individual, um, it, it makes much more impact, you're, you're much more affected by a story that's about an individual, you know, this is kind of close relation of Jesus and Mary Magdalene, it, it makes it a better story. Um, and uh, anyone telling Anyone recounting history in the ancient world had to tell good stories. It, it's, about, it's communication. It's not. It's not just sort of dry writing down of detail. You know, it's communication. Um, and and so there's a sense in which uh, varying the detail or the way you tell it is part of good storytelling. And and I think ancient people were happy with the idea that stories were told somewhat differently by different but storytellers. But does that mean then stuff was made up? No, no, I mean, no. It doesn't. That, I mean, I, you know, I, I, I mean, what John has done to focus on the one woman and left the others out of the picture. Now he does betray the fact that, that the, the other women that there is. Mary Magdalene comes back to the apostles and she says, we uh, found the tomb empty or whatever. So there's just one point that suggests Mary Magdalene actually had companions. If you think that um, John has focused the story on, on, on Mary. Um, Which and is the rule of good storytelling. It, 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 it focuses exactly, on a character exactly. rather than a... Exactly, and, and and John, I think, is a brilliant storyteller. You know, you, the, the, it's part of the part of the taking longer to tell each story that John uh, does. You know, the, the story of um, you know Lazarus and Martha and Mary goes on a little bit, but you get this real sense of characters and you know people you're involved with. So John is a skillful storyteller, uh, but that doesn't mean he's he's untrue to the facts necessarily. You know, um, an ancient historian had to do both. I know, James, that when we've had these sorts of discussions in the past, you, you've been open to the idea that um, there was a penchant for adding and for, if you like, dramatising at the very least or, and, and possibly adding extra things to stories. Um, and I remember there was a bit of a to and fro between you and Michael on the, the whole thing in the resurrection account, or uh, no, Jesus' crucifixion of the dead coming out, and you saying, well, isn't that an example of... of mm addition to uh, mm. a historical account so I mean do you do you where do you stand on on eyewitness mm. testimony do you do you think that eyewitnesses were essentially telling just what they had seen or were they prone to adding to mm. uh, kind of remembering but remembering more than maybe yeah. read really happened well I mean I, I mean I, I, I quite liked uh, Richard's idea the gist more than is, is I think that's the important thing about it you know we've got we know it's a roughly Right, so we don't have to be too worried about uh, slight discrepancies as if this is evidence that it didn't happen and so on and so forth. Um, you know, invention perhaps, and this is where we we debated before on the issue of the miraculous, whereas I think one of the implications of uh, Richard's model is that there are eyewitnesses to miracles. I mean, it, it has to be in one sense. I mean, and you do here and there, you know, give reference to the de incidental details of miracle stories, and and that seems to me, um, if you accept that, that is a revolutionary move in terms of you know the humanities, if you like, or history, and so on. I mean, that's uh, so that's where I would like to just see. So, so what are you saying? Are you saying then that up to this point, you can only be taken seriously as a historian? if you have a detached view yeah. whereby you say, we all know the miracle didn't take place, but they believed something had taken place. Whereas you're saying, Richard is saying, this is an eyewitness account of a miracle, and therefore it has to be taken as having happened. I, I, I would always qualify by saying I would never judge who gets taken seriously okay. or not. What I would say mm -hmm. is, uh, it's... Clearly, see as as counting as evidence for eyewitness testimony, Richard. I mean, oh, I'm sorry. Yes, um, 
well, I, I, I mean, I, the thing I did in the book, and I think it was probably a mistake that I didn't explain I was doing this, um, but I did treat the miracles in the Gospel accounts just on a level with everything else, and I didn't make any special issue of them. Um, and that's the way I do it myself. Um, but I, I, I quite see that, that for many people that's an issue, and I, I should at least do it. The reason I didn't go into it, of course, it becomes, I think, a philosophical issue whether miracles are, are possible and so on. Um, I mean, it is, of course, a question of uh, what worldview one comes to the, the evidence with. Um, and I can quite see that if someone has a worldview which excludes the possibility of miracle, then, then they're, they're already disinclined to be convinced by the evidence which might well convince them of something much more ordinary. Um, there is a question, of course, what counts a miracle? And I would suspect that James uh, would you be quite happy with many of Jesus' healings? Yes, I, I was. Yes, uh, in exorcisms. Yes. yes. Um, we wouldn't define them in terms of miraculous necessarily. No, I mean, most, you would see that people would, who witnessed that would have witnessed something which you might see now as being some sort of psychoanalytical yeah. thing, but but they would have said a miracle. No, but they might not, not necessarily. Um, they wouldn't necessarily call it a miracle. I don't know. I mean, that could depend from case to case. But I think we could agree that we could potentially have eyewitness testimony to things like this. Okay. So, Yes, I, mean, I think the way they thought of miracle, I mean, they, they didn't think of miracle as an exception to natural law in the way that we would. Uh, I mean, they thought of miracle as, as a sort of very unusual and, and therefore arresting and impressive event, you know, which drew your attention to God being at work in some way or other. Um, and so I, I don't think that we need necessarily impose our distinction between what is and what isn't in accord with the laws of nature. Um, I mean, I, th I think there are a number of things going on here. I mean, one of, one of the... So we'll come back to that highly interesting uh, conversation. Um, um, so let's just recap where we've got to so far. We're basically reading an article which um, Dr. Barkham is summing up some of the key issues of his book, Jesus and the Eyewitnesses. And so you're wondering why we're reading that specific article. It's very key to understand in the book and it's the book sorry I've got an itchy nose it's the book that we're considering um, basically Barkham's thesis is that there is eyewitness material in the Gospels and he gives a lot of evidence in his book for why that's the case but before he can get to his uh, specific evidences he's got a big problem and the big problem is that throughout the history of uh, historical Jesus studies, uh, the form critics uh, influenced by Rudolf Bultmann have ruled the roost, they, and they ruled with an iron fist. <laughs> if you were in an academic in the 1960s and 70s, uh, and you were doing a quest for the historical Jesus studies, and you were to go against the form critics or who were in the Boltman school you would have seen you would have been seen as very odd and a bit of an outcast so it's important for Dr. Borkham to demolish this position and present a different perspective and present it with good solid evidence and like I said the um, the Boltman project had a criteria that was just not really applicable to doing the job so you had this criteria that Boltman had, like I've mentioned before, saying that anything um, that's got Judaistic first century Judaism in it, it is not historical. Uh, anything with Greek material in it is, and uh, is relevant for understanding who Jesus was. As you can tell, that's a bad criteria because when we look at first century Judaism, uh, Josephus, Philo and all the rest and all the Qumran and all the rest gives us an understanding of, of, of what people believed at that time and that was the cultural context of Christianity. So what we've done in the essay so far at Borkham's is we've read a bit, we've read him clearing the ground concerning this form criticism. Um, telling us about oral tradition, about how 
oral tradition is culturally specific that's the key word what that means is when we're talking about oral tradition of the Scandinavians it's not the same as the cultural did it oral traditions of China or the oral traditions of Papua New Guinea or the oral traditions of first century Judaism and that's where the foreign critics went wrong they they used one specific type of oral tradition and used that to to um, engage in historical inquiry that's a lesson for all of us that when we're doing historical inquiry we have to make sure that we understand the cultural context of the literature that we're actually engaging in and that's the beauty and the brilliance of Borkham he is actually looking at the way historians were writing in the first century and then he gauges the literature the Gospels how that relates to the literature surrounding literature and that's the beauty of it which we're going to unpack later on um, the significance of this methodology of Borkham's is once you begin to consider maybe there is eyewitness material it is a game changer in the debates about who Jesus is whether miracles happened or not as you can see with the atheist talking to Dr. Borkham he acknowledges this and, and sees that it's absolutely significant I've tried to make this aware I brought this to the to the attention of the internet I made hundreds of videos on this issue on the resurrection and this issue and it was a severe blow to modern atheism on the internet but I got threatened by the atheist and they threatened me I got phone calls threatening me and I had to get rid of thousands of my scholarly videos and this kind of scholarship that I was bringing on the internet they stopped and they won't debate me and discuss with me and they continue to attack my character even to this day but that's why I want to bring you to this scholarship and for you to engage with it because it's really significant and important so that's just a review of where we're at and we're going to continue now in detail on on um, aspects of evidence we have seen that whether a particular oral society has a real sense of history and is concerned to transmit historical tradition relatively faithfully is a matter of specific culture that cannot be predicated as a priori the case of early Christianity it has frequently been shown that Christians did have a clear sense of past. not only the Gospels themselves but also the traditions they relate show consciousness of a distinction between the period of the ministry of Jesus and the period after his resurrection of course Christians were interested not in the past purely for its own sake very few people in the ancient world were but the religious, religiously relevant past but the concern deriving no doubt from the early Christian movement strongly Jewish understanding of salvation and eschatology salvation history and eschatology was precisely for the religiously relevant past they did not collapse the past history of Jesus into the pure present of his exalted lordship and presence in the community this indicates that the early Christian movement had an interest in preserving the traditions about Jesus faithfully this of course need not mean verbatim it is quite consistent with the degree of variation from one performance to another this again cannot be predicated a priori for a model of oral tradition but must be determined from the evidence we have for the Jesus traditions our best evidence is the degree of variation that actually exists in parallel passages of the Gospels especially if we can assume that the Gospel writers varied their source in much the same way that one oral performance might differ from another it has often been noticed that as a general rule there are more close verbal correspondence in the case of sayings of Jesus than there is in narrate narrative it would be entirely consistent that what we know of oral tradition if more or less the exact reproduction was generally expected for sayings whereas in the case of narratives what was expected to remain constant was the main structure and core elements while essential detail could vary 
Once we've abandoned form critical presuppositions about the way traditions must have developed, there is probably no reason to suppose that the degree of variation in the tradition was ever greater than the variation we can observe in the extant Gospels. We do not need to postulate original versions of traditions differently, wide, differing, differing widely from the extant ver versions. Finally, since the evidence shows a broadly conservative preservation of tradition, we should not expect sayings of Jesus or stories about Jesus to have been regularly, as a matter of course, invented de novo and added to the tradition as the form critics supposed. In summary, then, the early Christian communities more li most likely distinguished historical accounts from fictional stories in the way many oral societies do. One performance of a tradition would vary from one another more so in the case of stories about Jesus than in the case of remembered sayings of Jesus. But variation was simply from one performance to another, not in the form of unlinear development that would enable, I'll unpack this for you in a minute, would enable us to reconstruct tradition history in the form of critical manner. Interpretive modifications were made, but neither these modifications nor the more ordinary performance variations need have created greater differences than we can observe in the parallel material of the Gospels. If all this is correct, the crucial factor that remains to be considered is how the traditions were controlled. The form critics postulated entirely uncontrolled tr transmissions by the community as such. To establish an alternative paradigm, we need to determine how the substantially faithful pres uh, preservation of the tradition was achieved. Unpacking this, what what um, Barkham is saying is that oral tradition, being culturally specific, um, the oral tradition of first century Judaism was often had um, a literary sense to it. It was telling stories of a narrative type. What that means is there would have been a general core of authentic history within that narrative. And there might have been minor variations, but there would have been a consistency in the general structure of the oral tradition. So that's what he's arguing for there. Um, so I think. How would a contemporary reader of the Gospels, how they would expect this to be a, a record of what happened? Um, they would be looking for historical information. They would not have expected it to be mere legend or an entertaining bit of fiction or other kinds of literature that you could be reading. Um, the Gospels look like a biography. Luke, I know, begins his Gospel by claiming that his work is based on the reports of our top tie eyewitnesses. Mm -hmm. Can we take that seriously? Yes, I think we should um, because it connects very easily with the way historians in the ancient world viewed the writing of history. Um, they actually thought that you could only really write contemporary history, in other words, history within the lifetime of people who had been involved, participants in the events. Um, history later than that is, is not really good history. You can only write good history within that span of time when there are eyewitnesses still around. And it's also interesting that what, what Luke actually does is describe them as the eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, which implies that these eyewitnesses of Jesus' ministry and, and the events of his death and resurrection, uh, these eyewitnesses had a role in the early Christian communities. They were ministers of the word, that is, they were giving their eyewitness testimony. Um, they were the people whom uh, someone like Luke, but also quite ordinary Christians or Christian preachers would look to as the kind of authoritative sources for knowing about Jesus. 
Um, and that's, I think, very important that these were not just people who had been eyewitnesses and then, you know, 30 years later, Luke comes along and asks them. Um, they're actually people who have been telling their testimony all the time. And that's an important point, I think. Sometimes people give the impression that between Jesus and the Gospels, this is a long period of time in which all kinds of things could have happened. And how can we... That was the way you did history. So we'll go on to the paper and then we've got some lectures of Borkham to look at and to reflect on. So we'll work through the paper, um, we're on page 6. An alternative paradigm eyewitness testimony. An eminent British New Testament scholar of the mid 20th century, Vincent Taylor, who was himself in favour of a moderate version of form criticism once remarked that if form critics were right, the eyewitness to the history of Jesus must have ascended to heaven immediately after Jesus' resurrection. He went on to point out that many eyewitness participants in the events of the gospel narratives did not go into permanent retreat. For at least a generation they moved among the young Palestinian communities and though preaching and fellowship the rec re recollections were at the proposal of those who sought information. The point was that while the form critics allowed that any authentic Jesus tradition must originally have derived from eyewitnesses, the eyewitnesses played no further part in the reconstruction of the transmission of the tradition. By omitting the eyewitnesses from many continuing role, the form critics were able to place several decades of oral tradition between the eyewitnesses and the Gospels. In Jesus and the eyewitnesses, I have tried to work through the implications of supposing that the eyewitness did not disappear from the early Christian movement as soon as they had formulated some tradition. The eyewitnesses were not only still alive through the relevant period but were in touch with the Christian communities. The major eyewitnesses such as the Twelve Apostles were very well known. They, they, they would have remained throughout their lifetime the accessible sources and authoritative guarantors of the tradition they themselves had formulated at the beginning. Moreover, as well as the major eyewitnesses, mostly the well-known disciples of Jesus, there were also many minor eyewitnesses who told the story, perhaps of the miracles by which themselves had been healed by Jesus or some other encounter with Jesus that had changed their lives. Paul, writing his first letter to the Christian, Corinthians around the year 50, 20, year 50, 20 years after the event, recites a well-known catalogue of people to whom Jesus appeared after the resurrection. Among them he mentioned an appearance to 500 believers at the time, many of whom are still alive, 1 Corinthians 15, 6. This comment would be pointless unless he meant, if you don't believe me, check it out with some of those people. If he could say that with regard to minor eyewitnesses of most of the 500 must have been, how much more would it have been true of the major eyewitnesses, people such as the Twelve Apostles and James, the brother of Jesus, whom Paul also includes in his list? He did not need to say that they were still alive and well at the time of writing because his readers would have been well aware of that, that many eyewitnesses were not only still alive but also accessible is taken for granted. We have seen that in oral societies, traditions and not by means necessarily the anonymous community traditions the form critics postulated, but can be closely associated with individuals. It could be the case that the Jesus traditions were, in many cases, associated named individuals or groups, such as the Twelve, from whom they originated. We shall shortly see reason to think this if the eyewitnesses continue to be well known in the early Christian movement, it would be natural for them to be treated as authoritative source and guardians of their tradition. 
At the last resort, it was they who could ensure the stability of the traditions. We have observed already that because they were written within living memory of the events, the gospel writers should be seen not so much as recorders of oral tradition, more as composers of oral history. The distinctive importance of accessing traditions within the living memory while eyewitnesses are still available is common both to modern oral history and to the way history was envisaged in the Greco-Roman literary context of the Gospels. Ancient historians believe that history could properly be written within the lifetime of eyewitnesses whom the historian could himself interview face to face. This demanding criterion for adequate testimony was, it was even if not always practiced, at least widely regarded as a historiographical best practice. Thank you very much. It's very good to be here with you. Um, just before I begin, um, the handouts, I just wonder because there's so many people whether some people might not have got handouts. For this lecture, it's not very important. For the second lecture, you really need handouts. So uh, I don't know if you need more, but make, make sure if you can that you've got the handout for, to, for, the, for the second lecture. Um, well, as you know, this series of lectures I've called the God's Histories, and this first one is the Gospels as Historical bio Biography. Um, but I want to begin by just a, a word about that word history, which we do actually use in, in a number of different ways, and it's worth just uh, thinking that through. We, in English, the word history, has, I think, has three meanings predominantly. And history can mean what happened in the past. It can also mean the study of what happened in the past. So that's, as it were, the academic subject, study history at university or whatever. Um, that's the, we, we can call that history. Um, but we can also mean literature about what happened in the past. You know, historians write history, um, and that's the literary phenomenon that, to be more precise, uh, we can call historiography. I'll use that term also as I go on. And really in these lectures, it's that particular to topic of historiography that I'm interested in, um, it's why I've given the lectures the overall title, The Gospels as Histories. Gospel as History is a good deal more ambiguous. Gospel as History is, I, I hope, draws attention to my interest, um, which is not directly, though there are some, uh, have some bearing on questions like whether the Gospels are reliable records of what happened, um, but primarily we're concerned with the question, what sort of historiography are they? The Gospels certainly are histories in some sense. Very few people doubt that. They purport to inform their readers about events that happened in the past. But what sort of history are they? And we must appreciate the fact that they're not, there's not just one way of writing history. There are a whole variety of ways of writing history. Uh, in the, in the Greco-Roman world of antiquity, the kind of literary context in which the Gospels were written, there were various kinds of literature written about the past, a number of different kinds of literature written about the past. And in the modern world, as the academic discipline of history has developed over the last two centuries, there have also been different kinds of historiography. So in these lectures, what I want to do is to compare the Gospels with the sorts of historiography we can identify in other ancient literature to see where the Gospels should be placed, as it were, on the, on the map of historical writing in, in, their, in their own time. And I should also, rather more unusual task, I should also be comparing the Gospels with some modern approaches to history. Because I think this too can illuminate the character of Gospels. It would, of course, be anachronistic to, to actually put the Gospels into a modern category of historiography. But I think that some modern approaches to history can actually work heuristically. In other words, they can open up for us 
aspects of the Gospels that we might not other, otherwise have noticed or paid much attention to. But for this first lecture, we stay in the ancient world. There are, I think, two books that must be foundational for any attempt to place the Gospels within the map of ancient historiography. Those of you who have got the handout, I think these are on page two. The first is Richard Burridge's book, What Are the Gospels? A Comparison with Greco-Roman Biography, which was first published in 1992. It was one of the best-selling volumes in the monograph. And is entitled History as I'm sorry, it's entitled Story as History, History as Story. Unless I get that, have that in front of me, I'm prone to put it the other way around. But it's his a story as history, history as story, the gospels in the context of ancient oral history. And that was first published in 2000. Now these two books take two rather different approaches to our question: what sort of history are the gospels? Burridge relates the Gospels to ancient biography, whereas Biesco relates them to ancient historiography, and whereas we could quite legitimately use the word historiography to include biography, the ancients actually tended to distinguish between biography and history, um, and I'll say a bit more about that later. Um, so in a way, um, Burridge and Biesco are directing us to different areas of ancient historical writing, but I think, as you'll see, I think they're actually both right, and they've laid the foundations on which I think uh, any attempt to uh, approach this topic uh, must be based. So let's begin with Burridge. Now, for most of the 20th century, it was customary for the scholars to deny, often with considerable assurance, that the Gospels are biography. But it's now become common to maintain quite the opposite, that the literary genre of the Gospels is that of ancient biography. Now, it is important to say ancient biography, because um, scholars who take this view are not comparing Gospels with modern biography, itself, of course, quite varied uh, in character. Um, the genre of the Gospels must be established from the study of ancient literature contemporary with the Gospels. And Burridge's argument is that they are and would have been recognized by their early readers as the kind of literature that the ancients usually called just lives, uh, bioi in Greek, the vitae in Latin. Burridge was not the first to argue that in the later part of the last century, a growing number of scholars had been making the same argument, but Burridge's, Burridge has made the most thorough and convincing study, and the results of Burridge's work have been very widely accepted. Not universally, but very widely accepted by gospel scholars. Burridge worked with a number of examples of Greek and Roman biographies, and he gathered a whole series of generic features that he argues are criteria for recognizing who's used to reading or hearing works of that kind. So just roughly the kind of things he looks at, there, there are opening features such as title, prologue, opening words, uh, then there are the subjects. Um, I'm going to use the word bi biography for the person a biography is written about. Um, handy word, if, if uh, even if I've invented it, I'm not sure. Um, but so the subject, which in, which includes in Burridge's work, the extent to which the biography is the is the major acting person throughout the work and also allocation of space to various topics. Um, and then he deals with external features, such as the length of the work, its formal structure, and so forth. 
Now, clearly, some of these features are more significant than others for recognizing the genre. But the use of these criteria enables Burridge to conclude, I quote him, that a wide range of similarities have been discovered between the Gospels and Greco-Roman Bioi. The differences are not sufficiently marked or significant to prevent the Gospels belonging to the genre of Bios literature. The increasing tendency among New Testament scholars to refer to the Gospels as biographical is vindicated. Indeed, he says, the time has come to go on from use of the word, uh, use of the adjective biographical for the Gospels of Bioi. Now, I'm not going to rehearse all his arguments, um, but really take Burridge's case uh, for granted. But I'll just mention some points that he makes about the genre of ancient biography that I think are worth noting. And Burridge draws on, on general studies through genre by teaching critics and so forth. And he stresses that genres develop and change. Genres, he says, are dynamic and flexible groupings whose boundaries and labels shift. So to follow up Burridge's argument, we don't have to suppose that there's nothing new about the Gospels. Um, the Gospels may, I think, very plausibly represent a relatively novel development within the broad and flexible genre of ancient biography which means that if uh, people heard the Gospels read or read them for themselves for the first time, they'd think, ah, oh, this is a biography, that's how they would identify it, but then they might discover that, you know, there are things about it um, that are not usual in biographies, um, and so it would come to be a sort of subgenre, but a special sort of subgenre. So we might still call, talk about the Gospel subgenre, um, but the development of the general category of biography. Um, the other thing that's well, well worth noticing, so we'll come back to this, is that different genres of literature can influence each other. Um, Burridge, quoting Alistair Fowler's work on the theory of genres, speaks of multifarious extensions and interactions of genre. So the boundaries of a literary genre are not necessarily hard and fast. They can be quite flexible and, and porous. And this leads to the very important topic of the Latin term is genera proxima, neighboring genres. In relation to a particular literary genre, there may be other genres that resemble it in some ways. And this close relationship can enable influence and borrowing from one genre to another. The ancient Greco-Roman period, Burridge writes that there was a lot of interplay and overlap between genres, particularly works on, this, on the edge of one genre and influenced by another. And again, he says, the boundary between bios and any of its genera proxima, neighboring genres, are flexible. And so borrowing or sharing generic features across the border may be expected. And Burridge provides a map of the various kinds of literature that overlap biography, such as moral philosophy, novel, history, and encomium. The genres that specially overlap and influence Bioi are encomium, which is a work written in praise of a particular person, and history, in the narrow sense that Greek Roman and writers tended to use, usually when Greek and Roman people said history, they meant political history. And that's really why they distinguished history from biography. Um, history is the history of nations and states and politicians and wars and all that kind of thing. Biography, of course, is the study of a particular person. So it's that particular relationship between biography and history um, that I want to dwell on a little bit and it, it seems to me it, um, it's very interesting if we can establish that some biographies, not by any means necessarily all biographies, but some biographies come especially close to historiography as Greek and Roman historians understood it. Now really the strength of Burridge's demonstration 
that the Gospels belong to the ancient genre of biography, lies in its generality. By showing that the genre was broad and flexible, Burridge makes room for the Gospels within it and shows that they are no different from some other examples of Okay, so I'll... This is just some of my notes. Um, on, on this issue of Jesus and the eyewitness accounts and... Um, and... Um, Borkham's book so what we'll do is we'll, I'll just talk about some other issues and take it from where Borkham's just left off. Um, basically, um, I wish I had my other notes because I've got a load of, of all this stuff. I've got my notes up there, but I've, that means I've got to pull all the notes that I've got and dig the other notes out. So I think we'll have a break for a few minutes um, and I'll just see if I can get my notes here. So I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll go here, you can see me get my notes and uh, I'll just talk to you uh, about uh, some of the issues that uh, Borkham is mentioned. Is mentioned. Um, so forgive me for this indiscretion, this scholarly indiscretion. Uh, I've got some important notes. Uh, I've, this is um, Borkham's book starting from page 93. But I've got page, I've got notes on his book from page 1 to 93. So I'll see if I can find them. These are my notes on James Dunn. Um, so, anyhow, um, I'll just talk about uh, Borkham. In his uh, in his book, Jesus and the Eyewitnesses, um, he talks about. Um, key ancient historians and he notices the Greek the Greek historians um, had a belief and that's what I'd like to find that some of the key data is a belief that eyewitness material was important what they would do they would go down to a city or a town and actually investigate an event what they were going to write about and then they would write their history based on that material. And there was a lot of debate about what true history was prior to, before Jesus and after Jesus, uh, during Jesus' life and after his life. And the debates were whether you are an accurate historian, whether you're actually uh, being faithful and uh, actually showing the eyewitness. Um, so I've, that's an important thing to note. You see, the point is, the whole point of it is, is I'll give you an example. When atheist, for example, said Jesus is a myth, and that um, Jesus um, was developed from Mithraism. Th this is a typical example of what I'm trying to get at. And Jesus developed from uh, Mithraism. All right. So you, that's what they say. So you, you, you deconstruct it, you look at it, the evidence. Uh, 
worry about this. You look at the evidence and you look at the history of Mithraism and what do you find? Well, what you find is there's virtually no literary sources. Get this, there's no virtually no literary sources to confirm Mithraism. When a scholar like Dr. Price talks about what Mithraism is, this Mithraism is a esoteric kind of ancient religion. But when Dr. Price and these uh, skeptical scholars talk about Mithraism and G Christianity came from Mithraism, and they talk about what it is authoritatively, they've actually got no ancient texts like Gospels or anything like that to tell them what Mithraism was all about. So basically, they're just trying to understand Mithraism from maybe pictures or maybe statues that they found you know they would have bull they would have uh, statues of bulls where the bull is sacrificed so the Mithra scholar would say well it's all very similar to Jesus but you see they've got no literary text to actually read what they're actually looking at the literary text that we do have about Mithraism spans over 1000 years of all the literature that I've, I've read for that 1,000 years, from right about 500 BC right up to about 600 AD. And what you find is the historians that mention Mithraism mention different things about Mithraism over that period of time. So Mithraism changes. Um, Mithraism in Persia in 500 BC is not the same as Mithraism in Greece, and Mithraism in Greece is not the same as Mithraism in the Roman Empire in 180 AD. So what does this, what, what am I trying to say? Basically the Mithra scholars are not actually trying to understand the historical times and because of that they come up with esoteric ideas. The beauty of Borkham's theories and ideas is it's based on his, the historical evidence of the way things were at the particular period of history when the Gospels were written. That's the beauty of this kind of scholarship. It's so immense and solid that as an atheist you have to take it seriously. I tried to get the atheists to see this but they stopped me from doing it. They got me off the internet with threats of violence. Um, I couldn't get the scholarship to you because they've had my thousands of videos taken off by threats. And the top scholars would not debate me. So there we are. Oh, I've got so many notes on this. Studies on myth where we might be getting close. I can So, what else is there to talk about? Uh, yeah, it was touched upon um, in the discussion with Crosley uh, and Borkham. It was touched upon um, about bias in historical inquiry and miracles. This is all the stuff on Mithraism. Hallelujah, 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 praise the Lord. Hallelujah, 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 praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, hallelujah, praise I found it first 100 pages and then after the 100 pages yeah we got it so we got some notes we can go through the notes thank you for your patience very very kind of you to bear with me at this little date but it will be worth your weight it will it will be worth your weight Oh, oh, excellent. Right. 
So I'll go through the book with my notes here. So we'll do some detailed stuff. Like I said, I did loads of videos. I did hundreds, not thousands of videos on this stuff. Because all that scholarship's been lost and not one atheist on the internet even stood up for me. And my rights were taken away. But alas, scholarship cannot be kept down. So there we are. Sorry for the little bit of drama and singing there. Not very academic of me. Um, anyhow, let's get on to some detail of the book. So I'm going to go through quite quite a bit of the book now. Um, now that I've got my notes. All right, and we'll listen to more lectures and discussions and we'll, we'll talk about it. He says, page three, excuse me, all history, meaning all that historians write, all historiography is an extricable combination of fact and interpretation. The empirical observable, the empirically, in, empirically, sorry, the empirically observable and the intuited or constituted meaning. Page three in Jesus and the eyewitness of the Gospels as eyewitness testimony. Yeah, all history is biased. All history has a particular way of interpreting. So you have Marxist history, you have postmodernist history, you have feminist history, you have the conservative evangelical history, you have Marcion history, you have Athanasius history. Everybody is biased. But that doesn't mean say we can't know information objectively in history. It's just what it means is we've got to be careful about our bias. Uh, I, I was laughing my head off at Dr. Price, forgive me Dr. Price, when he was interviewed by a guy called Ozzy, an atheist, on Live Life 8072 uh, show. And this uh, skeptical scholar said that that the, he didn't have any bias, that he looked at history with, with, with fair eyes, that presuppositions do not influence your interpretation of historical facts. That was just absolutely ridiculous. And it was touched upon in the discussion with Crosley and Borkham. If you don't believe that miracles can actually take place when you're investigating the resurrection, you're obviously not going to believe that the resurrection took place because you're biased against miracles. Unless you're open, and, and I've heard Ozzy and I've heard others say, well, you know, credulity, we look at evidence in a skeptical way. Yeah, but then there's credulity and, and credulity. There's healthy skepticism and unhealthy skepticism. There's a skepticism that is so skeptical that we can't know anything. Yes, we have to be skeptical and critically analyze historical information. But if historical information begins to build up and point to an event, then we have to be open to that evidence that it is that it is possibly that it possibly happened. You see? So presuppositions influence our interpretation of history. He says, by comparison with the Gospels, any Jesus reconstructed by the quest cannot fail to be reductionist from the perspective of the Christian theology. What that means is um, any scholar whether it be N.T. Wright, uh, Dale Allison, Dominic Crossan, and I've looked at them all, um, will all come with a bias. And there will always be some kind of reductionism in the sense that if there is miracles in that have happened in history, we won't know about them all because we'll be so skeptical. There is a um, a questioning that in a way automatically assumes that there are no miracles and what that means that 
makes it difficult for those scholars like N.T. Wright and others who want to say that there have been miracles within the Gospels and they have to concede to those historians some ground in order to make their point. Page 4. By comparison with the Gospels, any Jesus grief constructed by the quest cannot fail to be reductionistic from the perspective of Christian facts and theology. Page 4 again. Trusting testimony is not an irrational act of faith that leaves critical rationality aside. It is, on the contrary, a rationally appropriate way of responding to authentic testimony. You know, testimony is just central to knowledge. I mean, whether you agree with that or not, it's a fact. I mean, basically, science is just testimony. It's one group of individuals' testimony to certain things. Testimony is at the heart of, of human knowledge. Um, it's how we know by human experience. Page 5. It is true that a powerful trend in modern development of critical historical philosophy and methods finds trusting testimony a stumbling block in the way of the historian's autonomous access to that she or he can verify independently. But it is also a rather neglected fact that all history, like all knowledge, relies on testimony. Page 5. <laughs> so you can't have your cake and eat it. You can't say we don't, as historians, we don't want to consider testimony as, as important in, his, in our historical inquiry, when actually epistemologically we cannot do without it. Page 5. We need to recognize that, historically speaking, testimony is a unique and uniquely valuable means of access to reality. Page 5. Our post our modernist perspective on knowledge with this scientism that all that matters is this so-called objective science is a, an epistemology that that is not akin to reality. See, some of our deepest things that we know are by what people experience and are committed to individually. And that cannot be deconstructed by science. How we deeply feel about something, how an event has deeply impacted us, is something that science cannot fully pontificate. It's like Thomas Nagel's question, can we know the mind of a bat? I mean, we can know things about the mind of the bat, but the mind of a bat, we cannot fully get to the essence of what the mind of a bat experiences, scientifically speaking. In other words, this scientific model of knowledge and epistemology doesn't take into consideration a wide variety of epistemologies. One of them is, for example, testimony in, and how that relates to feeling, how it relates to knowing. Have a look at Dr. Evans, uh, a Kugengard scholar on the resurrection. He will give you uh, reflections on the philosophical, epistemological, subjective side of, um, of the issue. Mm. I'm just going to go and make a cup of tea, and uh, I'll be back in a few minutes. We've got 100 pages of the book to reflect on. We've got some bits of lectures to look at. So it's getting exciting. I'm feeling a bit invigorated now. I was very, very tired before. So I'm going to have a cup of tea. So we'll listen to a bit more of Borkum. Um, so make yourself a cup of tea and I'll be back in a minute. The genre, then some of those other examples are from each other. It's a broad genre, uh, rather different types of biography. The Gospels are not necessarily so much different, but they're a different again. Now, Burridge scarcely attempts to go beyond this general conclusion to locate the Gospels more precisely within the diverse range of ancient biographies. Are they more like some of the ancient theory we know than of others? Part of the difficulty in answering this question um, is that there really has not uh, been produced a useful typology of ancient biographies. Um, there's an old attempt to do this 
by Friedrich Leo, which was influential for a long time. Most people have now come to the conclusion that it's um, not at all a reliable way of categorizing biographies in the ancient world. But we haven't really got a study that gives us a clear map of the kinds of biographies there were in the ancient world. Now, Burridge does, in a sentence, very briefly, offer three criteria that could define subgenres within the, the broad genre of bios. Uh, first of all, he, he refers to content, which may be either historical or philosophical, he says. He's thinking of biographies of philosophers that tell you a lot about their philosophical teaching. The content, there's structure, which may, he says, be either a chronological structure, what we most likely think of in a biography, simply uh, tracing of someone's life chronologically, but the arrangement of material could also be topical, so that that's a, uh, that's a possible distinction. And the third one, which I think is the most important, is the influence of neighboring genres, um, which could make a biography, Burridge says, either historical or encomiastic. I think the possibilities here are, are greater than he notes. Um, for example, many biographies have content uh, that is neither historical nor philosophical, but literary. A lot of lives of poets and dramatists, literary persons, and as well as novels, uh, sorry, as well as biographies influenced by historiography, there are also biographies that are strongly influenced by the genre of the novel or the entertaining story and, and overlap. Uh, with that kind of fictional literature. Now, what I'm going to do now, in the absence of a, a clear typology of ancient biographies, is to introduce you to, I think, three ways in which we may uh, distinguish between some biographies and others. And in the course of this, I think we would come to see uh, how the Gospels uh, fit into this picture. Now, the first difference among biographies is an obvious one. They can be distinguished by the kinds of figures that they concern, rulers or generals or poets or philosophers or whatever. And there are perhaps two main types. There are political biographers, biographies, um, where the biography is a, a, a military commander or a politician or a lawgiver, something like that. All of the uh, most famous ancient biographies, Plutarch, we have 50 of his biographies, and they're all of this kind. They're all So forth. Uh, these are often much shorter, largely because the people who wrote them didn't have much information about these figures. Um, but, but people wanted it, um, you know, rather like nowadays. You know, if people enjoyed uh, poetry or the plays or something, uh, all the philosophy of the particular person, they wanted to read about their lives, and so um, writers had to supply such lives. Uh, often they had to resort to a good deal of fiction. Um, in order to find something to say about ancient figures um, who, uh, about whom very little uh, was known. So those two categories, I think, cover a great deal of ancient biography, political and intellectual. Um, some people have proposed a third category, um, which is attractive, if we're thinking about the Gospels, but actually much more difficult to, to, to identify. And candidates for this include the life of Apollonius of Tyana, perhaps the, perhaps the work that is most like the Gospels uh, in ancient literature. I'll say some, some more about that tomorrow. Um, or Porphyry's life of the philosopher Plotinus. Uh, he's more than just a philosopher. Uh, there's a, a degree of 
uh, divine connection, as it were, going on in his life, and a few more, but they really add up to a motley crew. Um, they are quite difficult, I think, to recognise as a distinct category. So I think trying to put the Gospels in this category is problematic. I'll just say that much to start with. Uh, having made that distinction according to the type of person who is the biography, um, it is also, I think, worth um, noting that Burridge's argument doesn't require us to put Jesus into some existing category of sort of person in order for the Gospels to be biographies. In other words, in principle, biographies could be about just about anybody. So even if Jesus is a very unique sort of person, it doesn't mean that the Gospels are not biographies. Now the second way I suggest that biographies can be categorized is by distinguishing between the lives of contemporary figures, contemporary at the time of writing, and non-contemporary figures. And effectively, this is to distinguish a category of lives of individuals with whom the biographer either had himself had personal contact, or at least about whom he had learned from people who did know that person well. And there were quite a number of biographies of this kind. Lucian's biography of the philosopher Demonax. Uh, he had studied with that man himself, or Xenophon's life of Agisilaus, the Spartan king and general with whom Xenophon had served, or Tacitus's life of Agricola, the uh, Roman politician, who was Tacitus' own father-in-law. Um, there are other examples of cases where the figure is within uh, close living memory, as it were, and the biographer actually knew that person. Sometimes biographies were even written during the subject's lifetime, as Cornelius Nepos's life of his friend and patron Atticus was. And obviously, also in this category belong autographies like that of the Jewish historian Josephus. So there's a category of contemporary biographies, if you like. But by contrast, of course, many biographies were written long after, even centuries after the biography's death. And the importance of making this distinction is that it corresponds to a distinction that ancient writers often make between contemporary and non-contemporary history. Non-contemporary history, history going far back behind the writer's time, was written, but it wasn't really esteemed by contemporary history, because in the case of contemporary history, the historian was expected to write on the basis of eyewitness testimony to the events, either his own or that of people he had personally And so by definition, good history, real history, had to be contemporary history, the history of events within living memory. Now particularly in view of the closeness of historiography and biography as ancient literature, and the overlapping nature of the two, neighboring genre, um, we should, I think, expect that that sort of judgment would also apply in the case of biographies. The writer of a contemporary biography would expect it surely to have had personal knowledge of his subject, or at least close contact with people who had known his subject. And the fact that some such biographies were at pains to point out that they had such eyewitness access to their subjects confirms this is what was expected in antiquity. Now the Gospels, just to note for the time being, 
Gospels, almost everybody agrees, were written within the living memory of Jesus. Perhaps rather late in that period, but not accidentally, I think in my view, not accidentally at a time when there were eyewitnesses still available, still living, who could tell their own stories. So the Gospels, I think, on those grounds, qualify as contemporary biography. Now, my third criterion for classifying biographies is that close relationship between genera proxima, neighbouring genres. And for my purpose in these lectures, the important neighbouring genre is historiography. to be done in a, in, a, in a work of history or biography. Now, historians and biographers did certainly have different perspectives on the important indi individuals who appear in both uh, types of work. You can look at Plutarch's biographies, for example, all those politicians. Plutarch, Plutarch writes biographies of them. Other historians tell uh, political history that, in which those individuals feature. But they, they do it rather differently, that the historian is concerned with the individual's role in the wider, wider course of events, while the biographer may be interested in personal anecdotes, for example, which don't do much for the course of history, but they do illuminate the character of the person who's writing about. Um, and Plutarch and others make that sort of distinction. Um, Plutarch sometimes expressly apologizes in, in a sense for not telling you all the kinds of things about a figure that you might find in history, um, but telling you lots of more personal detail uh, that he thinks biography is for. So in that sense, um, biography and history could come quite close together. And the key point I think here is although the aims and content of biography may differ from those of history, and that's what some of the biographers say, these writers do not suggest that the method of the biographer, his access to and use of sources, should be different from that of the historian. And we can, I think, readily understand that biographers such as this could take what was regarded as best practice in historiography um, and take that also as the ideal for the biographer. Now, this close relationship between biography and history, as I've just suggested, would seem at first sight to apply only to political biography, only to the sort of figures uh, of biography who are also key figures in the development of political and military affairs. But this is not, um, and this is necessarily the case, because history meant uh, political history. And in fact, we'll attend to this again later, almost the only persons who appear as individuals in historiography biographies close to historiography, even though uh, the life of a contemporary person such as a philosopher could not overlap in its subject matter with historiography, it would seem, however, that some of the ideals of practice, some of the ideals of historiographical, historiographical practice did spread to other kinds of biography and not just political. So that's what I want to say for the moment about placing Gospels on the map of different sorts of biography. 
And at this point, I want to introduce that second major book uh, that I referred to as foundational for this kind of work, and that's Samuel Biersko's um, book, Story as History, History as Story. Um, Biersko compares the practice of Greco-Roman historians with the fairly recent modern historical discipline of oral history. And key element, I think, is that the role of eyewitness informants are very similar in the two cases. I've already uh, noticed the, the fact that major Greco-Roman historians people like Thucydides, Polybius, Tacitus, um, thought that real history could only be written while events were still within living memory. And they valued as their sources the oral reports of direct experience of the events by people who had been involved in the events. Ideally, the historian himself should have been a participant in the events he narrates, as, for example, Thucydides and meet and talk to and get them from. That was the ideal. Of course, not everybody lived up to the ideal. Not everybody who wrote history lived up to those ideals. And Lucian, for example, has great fun uh, critiquing all sorts of historians who clearly are not following uh, best practice. But most would have employed oral traditions and written sources at least to supplement uh, oral material. But the oral material was the key thing. Um, and if historians really wanted to live up to the ideal, um, access to oral reports um, was pretty much essential. And some of the bad historians pretend that they have access to good sources. Uh, but that sort of backhanded uh, recognition of, of the fact that this was best practice. Now, a point that Biersko stresses is that for these Greek and Roman historians, the ideal eyewitness was not the dispassionate observer, but the person who participated in the events, someone who's close to the events, someone whose direct experience of what happened enabled them to not just report a few facts, but also to give a sense of the significance of what they had seen. The historian, says Biersko, preferred the eyewitness who was socially involved, or even better, had been actively participating in the events. Involvement, he says, was not an obstacle to a correct understanding of what they perceived as historical truth, was rather the essential to a correct understanding of what had really happened. And this is important because I think a lot of modern people tend to think that the sort of uninvolved, dispassionate observer will be the best witness. But ancient historians, and I think the authors of the Gospels as well, um, saw that you could get inside the events from participants in them in ways that you couldn't if you just relied on sort of people who happened to be around and happened to see what was happening. There's a coherence of fact and meaning, in other words. Um, eyewitness witnesses were able both to give a sort of empirical report of what anyone might have observed, but also a sort of engaged interpretation which came out of their involvement in the events. Biersko exploits, I think, quite uh, effectively. Oral historians today realize, on the one hand, that bare facts do not make history, and that the subjective aspects of an eyewitness's experience and memory are themselves evidence 
that the historian should not discard. Well, on the other hand, modern oral historians um, are aware, very importantly I think, that the person who's involved actually remembers much better than the disinterested observer. So they actually may get the facts um, a, lot, uh, a lot more carefully reported um, than those who just happen to be observing. So, in a way, the eyewitnesses with their mixture of, as, as it were, empirical facts and, and meaning get taken over into ancient historians. And, and also, we have to remember that, of course, the, the Greek and Roman historians um, are themselves shaping their narrative. They, they themselves have their own um, uh, elements of interpretation uh, that they want to uh, bring out in the way that they tell the story. So having established the key role of eyewitness testimony in ancient biography, the Biscott argues that a similar role must have been played in the formation of the gospel traditions and the gospels themselves by individuals who were qualified to be both eyewitnesses and informants about the history of Jesus. He attempts to identify such eyewitnesses to find traces of their testimony in the Gospels. Um, and uh, he, he stresses that like the historians, um, this material would not be not just be facts, but an interpretation of what was going on, a sense of its meaning um, from those who had experienced it and remembered it. The Gospel narratives, he says, are syntheses, syntheses of history and story. That's why his book is called Story as History. Uh, synthesis of the oral history of an eyewitness and the interpretative and narrativizing procedures of an author. So, in Biescog's account, the eyewitnesses to the events of Jesus' history do not disappear behind a long process of anonymous transmission and formation of Jesus' traditions by the Christian communities, as the very influ influential scholarly model um, of form criticism um, supposed in the 20th century. Rather, the eyewitnesses Um, now, Biesco's work was one of the starting points for my own work on the Gospels and the eyewitnesses in my book, uh, which you now all have seen, I think, uh, Jesus and the Eyewitnesses, the Gospels as Eyewitness Testimony. And in that book, I developed a, um, a thoroughgoing uh, alternative to the dominant picture in 20th century scholarship of how the traditions about Jesus reached the evangelists and were incorporated in their Gospels. Developing Biesco's model of ancient oral history, I proposed that the eyewitnesses of the history of Jesus remain throughout their lifetimes the accessible sources and the authoritative guarantors of the traditions that they themselves had formulated in the beginning when they first told their stories. So it was the right moment to write history based on the eyewitness testimony. And it's also a key component of my argument that the gospel traditions were not, for the most part, transmitted anonymously, as is usually assumed, but were associated with the eyewitnesses from whom they derived, especially the twelve apostles, but also some others. So in general, I've argued that the texts of the Gospels as we have them are close to the way the eyewitnesses themselves told their stories. Allowing, of course, for the shaping of the material by the evangelists themselves. In one case, I think, the case of the fourth Gospel, the evangelist was himself the eyewitness, the main eyewitness source of his own material. I 
category of think is very important for our thinking about the Gospels, and I've, I've developed that at some length in the book. But it's important to say that testimony is not a literary genre. So this isn't an alternative to the Gospels as biography. Testimony is not a literary genre. It certainly wasn't a literary genre in the ancient world, but testimony is a key, key, key part of the ancient genre of historiography. From what I've said already about the role of eyewitnesses and so forth in history of the ancient world, clearly testimony uh, is closely related to the practice of historiography. Um, so we could say that the Gospels are biographies that are close to historiography, especially in the role they give to testimony. Um, they do depend on comparing the Gospels with the practice of Greek and Roman historians, and so they relate quite closely to uh, the arguments of this lecture. But to return to genre, Bisco is content to speak broadly about historiography <coughs> and not to examine the differences between historiography and biography. Historiography. Well, you've done well. I uh, I just had a cup of tea and uh, a sandwich, <coughs> so we'll get on. I've listened to the lectures before. Uh, they're really good, aren't they? Uh, Dr. Borkham is a, a absolute top top scholar. <coughs> okay. Um, so I'm reading from his book, Borkham's book, The Guy Who You've Just Seen Lecture. I'm reading uh, Jesus and the Eyewitness Gospel, the Gospels as I had witnessed testimony 2006, so I'm reading from that. We need to recognize, says Borkham, that historical speaking testimony is a unique and uniquely viable means of um, access to reality and it's interesting if you you might have touched it on in the video but um, ancient historians uh, and ancient culture actually valued this more than we realize um, he says testimony offers us I wish to suggest a look sorry can't read my, my notes there a respectable historiography, a category for reading the Gospels as history and also a theological model for understanding the Gospels as the entirety, entirely appropriate means of access to the historical reality of Jesus. This is the assumption that the, he's on about fall criticism. This is the assumption this is the assumption that the traditions about Jesus, his acts and his words pass through a long process of oral tradition in the early Christian communities and reach the writers gospels of the gospels only late, late stage page six that assumption um, cannot be verified because you look at 1 Corinthians 15 verse 1 to about five or six we know that that was early historical information you know it goes back to uh, ra written around about 55 AD and it goes back to even early source of her oral tradition so this idea that there was this Chinese whispers over like a long period and the Gospels changed um, and, the, and a mythological Jesus developed and changed is just cannot be verified um, Anyhow, this, this is going over some of what he said in, in the article. He goes, if, he, he quotes Vincent Taylor, if foreign critics are right, the disciples must have been translated to heaven immediately after the resurrection, page 7. That's an important point 
one of the misunderstandings of scholars uh, over the last 80 years is because they thought communities twisted and molded the oral tradition and because they didn't realize that individuals were important too. Um, one has to ask, well, after Jesus, what happened to the disciples? Did the disciples just disappear off the scene? But well, that's crazy. They didn't dis disappear off the scene. They were there already. And as they were there, they would have been um, many of them would have been in charge in the passing on of the oral tradition. So you would have had James, John, and Paul and others who passed on that oral tradition. So if that's the case, this idea of Chinese whispers that things changed over a long period of time can't be substantiated. Martin Hengel says... Martin Gengel points out, one of the great scholars, that the idea that these early Christians would have not been able to understand what they were preaching about and would have been patchy on that is unthinkable. He says, uh, Borkham then goes on to mention, uh, I think it's uh, Palabius. Uh, an ancient Greek historian and uh, this ancient e Greek historian I've read some of his work and um, basically he he mentions um, he's, he actually states in his histories that as a historian you, you've got to be faithful in getting eyewitness material and he, he, he would he gave um, some criteria about going down to the town or the city and investigating people who'd seen a battle and if you don't record history like that then you're an irresponsible historian. Palabius was uh, prior to the time of Jesus uh, a few hundred years before Jesus I think and his books were standard works in the time of Jesus in the Roman Empire and there were standard works and seen as important models for writing history and Palabius used key words like um, Apodaya Kitek uh, Tike, this is a Greek word uh, which is a, a, um, a technical, technical Greek language for writing history and this was the kind of language that some Christians were using about writing history. So, uh, Papias um, mentions that he his understanding of the gospel came from eyewitness material, and he uses the same technical historical writing language that Palabius uses. So, in other words this eyewitness idea of history was key to uh, Christian historians e even in the early times of Christianity. Uh, one scholar says having established the key role of eyewitness testimony in ancient historiography um, by uh, Byerskog argues that a similar role must have been played in the formation of the gospel tradition, page 10 of Borkham's book. So Borkham, um, using other scholars who, who looked at like Palabius and other Greek historians, um, has developed his, his thesis of, of this eyewitness material. He says, quoting um, uh, Bayer, B Y R S K O G S page ten. The gospel narratives are the, the synthesis of history and story, of oral history and eyewitness, and the interpretation and narrating process of an author. The ancient historians whose stories know that first hand insider testimony gave access to truth that could not be 
otherwise. Though not uncritical, they were willing to trust their eyewitness information for the sake of the unique access that this gave, says Borkham. Other technical language uh, that Greek historians like Palabius used is um, I inquired A-N-E-K-R-I-N-O-N -E the Greek word. This is also language that uh, ancient historians used for doing history and um, Christian historians use. Palabius also uses the Pelagius, Pelagius also uses these kind of technical words for historical inquiry in his histories. Um, Lucius of Samorta also used this kind of technical language, Anneke Karenan. Sounds like Anne Karenan, doesn't it? Anne Karenan, which is used as judicial in context of inquiry. <clears throat> and um, Borkham mentions that these technical words that historians use for gathering eyewitness material that Palabius used, Lucian of Samorta, um, can be seen in Christian writers, and Jerome understands that. Papias um, also saw these things as important. Page 14. The source of oral historian are reminiscences, reminiscences hearsay, or eyewitness accounts about events and situations which are contemporary, that is, which occurred during the lifetime of the informants. This differs from oral tradition in that oral traditions are no longer contemporary. They have passed from mouth to mouth for a period beyond the lifetime of the informants. The two situations typically are very different with regard to the collection of sources as well as regard to the analysis. Oral historians typically interview participants in recent or very recent events. This makes the, the participant pa the participant passage from Papias very precious evidence of the way in which gospel traditions were understood to be related to the eyewitness at the way when and when the when the canonical gospels were written. So that's technical information about the nuances of that oral and written traditions. You can see that just saying that Jesus is a myth or just saying that there's no evidence for Jesus, it, just looking at all this stuff shows you that that's just, that is just really bad uh, scholarship, very, very poor indeed. What Papias says does not agree with what the scholars say. Papias belonged... Um, roughly speaking, to the third Christian generation and therefore to a generation that had been in touch with the first Christian generation, the generation of the apostles. He was personally acquainted with the daughters of Philip, the evangelist, and Philip, who was one of the twelve. This Philip... Um, in his life was the heir of the apostles and had two daughters who were well known as prophets in Acts chapter 21, 8 and 9. So let's go to that, Acts 21, 8 and 9. This is good. Have a break, folks. Go and have a break. Go and have a cup of tea and come back. You can watch the video later. There's loads of stuff that we've got to go through. Acts chapter 21. Why is Borkham talking about Papias? Because modern scholarship, Papias mentions about the Gospels, who wrote them, 
It's mentioned in Eusebius. Now, some critics, atheist scholars, say Eusebius is is uh, biased and uh, was unreliable. Eusebius wrote around about, I think it was the fourth century or something like that. Um, now, Eusebius quotes Papias, who was around about he was around right about 120 A.D. Papias, sorry, I always say Papias, but Papias. Um, knew people who knew the apostles and the way Papias understood tradition and how tradition is passed on is key to this whole debate of whether we, the Gospels are eyewitness material. The thing is is that modern scholarship for the last hundred years has dismissed Papias as not important. And what Borkham did is looked at Papias in a new way and thought no We've got to look at this in a new way, and actually Papias is very significant and important in understanding how oral tradition was passed on. And as we understand that, it informs us that there was eyewitness material to the Gospels. Very, very important, very, very key uh, to the debate and discussion. Um, so you're probably wondering why he's mentioning Papias. Acts chapter 21 Acts 21 verse 8 and 9 and the next day we were of Paul's company departed and came unto Caesarea and we entered into the house of Philip the evangelist which was one of the seven and abode with him the same man had four daughters, virgins, which did prophesy. The reason why Borkham quotes this passage, and the reason why he connects it to Papias is this. What he's saying is the literary, men, the literary culture and the oral culture of the early Christians was that individuals who were heirs of the tradition were significant. They had control and authority in passing on that eyewitness material and passing on and making sure that that material was correct. And Papias, when he commentated about the Gospels or commentated about something, he, would, he wanted to make sure that it could be rooted in a good source. And so he traces some of his source back to talking to the daughters of Philip. And what uh, Borkham is trying to prove is this is an example of how specific individuals are important to the passing on of oral tradition and the, these key individuals uh, were seen as authoritative in doing that. Do you get that? And do you remember back at the uh, form criticism that laid no stress on the individual people of authority passing on the tradition but said it was just community and so Barkham is unpacking his evidence here uh, concerning that. You can read Eusebius, Ecclesiastes, uh, Ecclesiastics I think, or Ecclesi you know, Eusebius Church History uh, chapter 3 verse 39 dash 9 All right. Page 33, Borkham mentions this, and here's a quote. Modern scholarship fails to take note the individuals as much as they should. I'd say that again. We've, we've labored that. Modern scholarship fails to take note to the individuals as much as they should. End of quote. So I've, I've labored this a few times tonight. Uh, I don't want to say any more. James Dunn says, on history, many and eyewitnesses. Sorry, he believes James Dunn believes that some of the gospel material is based on eyewitness material and based on collective memory. Says um, Borkham on page thirty-four. Even the Gnostics, says Borkham using Irenaeus 
claims that they passed on information uh, orally. In other words, he's saying that even in the Gnostics, there was um, some similarity in wanting to pass on information orally. I, I don't know about the details about that. I can't remember. All right. So that's the first 30 odd pages, and now we get we got some more here. Um, very patient. Anyhow, that's that's some of my notes. So we'll we'll continue with the debate that this debate um, yeah with Crosley things is it seems to me that any historian approaches the evidence and the work of a historian with certain assumptions about what the world is like I mean for example there are some historians who are are convinced of a sort of economic determinism in history that really everything that happens can be traced back to economic factors. You know, there's a sort of great man theory of history, you know, which is great individuals who really turn the course of history. I mean, these are presuppositions with which people come to the evidence, and and, and they they strongly affect the way people read the evidence. And I think being open to the possibility of exceptional events. Um, it, it is is a difference of that kind. Uh, it doesn't seem to me it has to be a kind of completely different form of approach. Um, so I, I I would say that all historians um, have uh, views of the world that affect the way they read the evidence. Um, and of course, those views of the world can then be affected by the evidence. Um, uh, and there's probably a sort of interactive thing going on there. Is, is part of the problem, James, that you would never uh, think about countenancing the miraculous in other areas of history, which might mention miraculous events, um, you know, so there may be um, in pagan histories uh, talk of events, but, but you wouldn't expect people looking into the history of that to think that that actually happened just because someone says it happened. Um, and therefore, why should we treat the Gospels differently in that sense, as though they have a special status where we can do history and talk about these things as, as having miraculously occurred? Is, is that part of your...? Well, I think so. I mean, I mean, if, if you take Richard's view, then you have to judge everything by, the, by that standard. So that's pagan, Jewish, what, whatever. Those need to be open. I'm not actually given an opinion whether I said the miracles should or shouldn't be included okay. in history. I think what I think is it's the, the this... It's, it's not just a revolutionary idea in terms of eyewitness testimony and views of foreign criticism. It's a revolutionary method in terms of this would, if Richard's correct, uh, be uh, direct, you know, very clear evidence of the miraculous or something like the miraculous taking place. And uh, that needs to be pursued. I mean, I know the difficult philosophical issue, but we all practice history. And if we're going to include something as dramatic as that, then I, then I think it needs... Uh, to I be mean, fleshed out a little. Is the consequence of that, James, that that weighs against, as it were, against Richard's thesis that this is eyewitness testimony? I mean, if you have stories of the miraculous, is for you, does that mean they can't have been written down by eyewitnesses because the eyewitness wouldn't have come away thinking it was a miracle, but it's someone who heard about the story in a slightly different format? Then attributes it to being miraculous or something. I mean, are you saying that you? If, if you have an eyewitness and they describe something miraculous, they just have to be wrong, or... Uh, no, sir, we do have people who, who say such things, uh, but it would, it would mean that uh, I would, the uh, Richard's model would be... To, uh, is, is questioned a little, then, in, in terms of, you know, not, not necessarily wrong, or I mean just questioned in terms of reliability of eyewitness. Uh, did they really see miracles? Or what did they see? That kind of thing. I mean, those ideas I think need to be fleshed out as well mm. uh, with, with Richard's model, um, because you know, these, these are these are significant. I suppose, I suppose one that people often come up with is you know the feeding of the five thousand, etc. You know, was it really a miracle? Did would, did it actually? You know, people had brought some along with them and and they shared it amongst each other and and, and everything. And um, I mean, but but the eyewitnesses, you, you know, the disciples of whoever. And passed it on to the people who wrote down the gospel said a miracle took place because we only had these many loaves and fishes and by the time we were finished we were gathering up baskets of the stuff um, I mean is that is that where you see maybe the problem being James that, that an eyewitness may think they saw something 
but in fact there might have been another explanation. Well, I mean, no, I mean, the, yes and no in one sense. I would, this is what I'd say, you know, what is the gist of that story then? What is the uh, kind of, what does it get, you know, that was happening in the life and teaching of Jesus? I mean, what my own explanation would probably be, I guess, if I was to write something on this in detail, that it's a piece of creative Jewish storytelling that they're sort of finding other texts uh, without, I mean, and that's, that seems to me a, a perfectly reasonable way of explaining why we get stories such as the miracle stories. Now, I might be wrong, of course, and happy to be proven wrong, um, but it's really questioning Richard's theory is, could you have the creative storytelling as well as the eyewitness testimony? Or if not, what is the gist of something like a feeding miracle? Yes, I mean, I don't think, I don't think some kind of creative storytelling can be completely ruled out. But I mean, one of the, one of the things I think about this is that it's a, it's a question of trusting your witnesses, and it seems to me that basic to historical method is that we consider whether a witness is trustworthy. And having decided that there's good reason to think the witness trustworthy, we then have to actually trust the witness. You know, so sometimes this may mean saying that you know something really rather unlikely. Um, we've got to take their word for it because they're right about everything else, and we trust them in general. You know, I mean, this part of my whole issue of methodology in the book is that what I don't think we can do is take the gospel events, you know, one story by one story, one at a time, one saying of Jesus, and sort of weigh up the probability of each one of them one by one. I mean, the form critical thing required you to do that because that's how they thought that they... Okay, I'm just going to read a few thoughts uh, about the importance of eyewitness material. Uh, Lord Darling, the former Chief Justice in England, asserts, we as Christians are asked to take a very great deal on trust, the teachings, for example, the miracles of Jesus. If we had to take all on trust, I for once should be sceptical. The crux of the problem of whether Jesus was or was not what he proclaimed himself to be must surely depend upon the truth or otherwise of the resurrection. On that great point, we are not merely asked to have faith. In its favour as living truth, there exists such overwhelming evidence, positive and negative, factual and circumstantial, that no intelligent jury in the world could fail to bring in a verdict that the res resurrection story is true. Michael Green, Man Alive, page 69. John Singleton Coldplay is recognised as one of the great legal minds in British history. He was Solicitor General of the British Government, Attorney General of Great Britain, three times High Chancellor of England, and elected High Steward of the University of Cambridge. He challenges, I know pretty well what evidence is, and I tell you, such evidence as that for the resurrection has never been broken down yet. Wilbur, Wilbur M. Smith, therefore, stand. Christian Apologetics, page, 19, page 425, 1972. Grand Rapids. J. N. Anderson, in the words of Armand Nicola of Harvard Medical School, is a scholar of international repute, eminently qualified to deal with the subject of evidence. He is one of the world's leading authorities on Muslim law, Dean of Faculty of Law at the University of London, Chairman of Department of Oriental Law at the School of Oriental and African Studies and Director of the uh, Institute of Advanced, Advanced Legal Studies at the University of London. He writes, Lastly, it can be asserted with confidence that men and women disbelieve the Easter story not because of the evidence, but in spite of it. J. N. D. Anderson, Christianity, The Witness of History, London, Tyndale Press, 1970, page 105. Sir Edward Clark, K.C., observes, as a lawyer, I have made a prolonged study of the evidence for the events of the first Easter day. To me, the evidence is conclusive and over and over again in the higher court, I have secured the verdict on evidence not nearly so compelling. Inference follows evidence. The truthful, truthful witness is always artless and disdains effect. The gospel evidence for the resurrection is of this class, and I as a lawyer accept it unreservedly as testimony of truthful men to the facts that they were able to substantiate. John Stott, Basic Christianity, IVF, 1969, page 47. Erwin H. 
Linton was Washington, D.C. lawyer who argued cases before the U.S. Supreme Court in a lawyer. Examines the Bible. He challenges... Resurrection is not only so established that the greatest lawyers have declared it to be the best proof fact of all history, but it is so supported that it is difficult to conceive of any method or line of proof that it lacks which would make it more certain. He writes and that even among lawyers, he who does not accept wholeheartedly the, the evangelical conservative belief in Christ and the scriptures has never read, has forgotten, or never been able to weigh and certainly certainly is utterly unable to refute the is, is irresistible force of the cognitive evidence upon which such faith, such faith rests. So So the scriptures of the Gospels are based on eyewitness accounts. Here, you came to the evangelist, just you know, they'd all come through community oral transmission. Um, and it's how the Jesus seminar does it, you know, they vote on each event and give it a, a, a rating, as it were. Um, I, I think normal historical method is that you go for the general reliability of your sources, uh, and so we've just got to think about whether Mark's uh, Mark is generally a, a trustworthy witness. And there are many special reasons for doubting. You know this or that within Mark, but on the whole, I think we've got to we've got to kind of go for trustworthy sources, um, and having decided they're trustworthy, um, go go along with them, give them the benefit of the doubt in difficult cases. Um, I mean, I, you see, I think that all kinds of very odd things happen in the world, and there are events in modern history. Uh, for which it's very good at testimony, but I, I have no idea what was really happening. You know, Fatima in, in, in Spain, you know, where hundreds of people saw an appearance of the Virgin Mary, and incredible testimonies to it, and I'm not inclined to think that the Virgin Mary appeared to all these people, but something happened, and I'm not, I'm not going to, you know, I have no way of explaining it away. So it seems to be a historian can very often, if they feel inclined, say something odd happened. We don't know what it was, but something odd happened. What the historian is not obliged to do is to explain everything. Why should we think we know how this or that happened all the time? You know, we're just dealing with the evidence, and the evidence may just point to something extraordinary we don't know what to do with. Um, and in the case of the Gospels, I, I mean, I think this is the case with regard to the resurrection, you know, which is the, uh, the important miracle. You know, if we believe that Jesus healed and exercised, as virtually everyone does, um, but didn't steal the storm or feed the 5,000, I mean, that doesn't make a huge difference to our reading of the story of the Gospels. The resurrection does. The resurrection is the extraordinary thing. And of course, Christians have never wanted to say the resurrection is just another miracle. It's quite exceptional because it's something extraordinary happened to Jesus, comparable only with the resurrection of everybody else at the end of history, which hasn't happened yet. You know. So I want to uh, just look at a few scriptures and then we'll go back to the book. And um, so I hope this is introducing you to some new ideas, new thinking. Um, 2 Peter chapter 1.16. So let's just turn to some scriptures and, and look at um, is eyewitness material important for the gospel writers? Uh, and the New Testament, 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 16 For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty so you can see the key to the scholarship of Borkham which has revolutionized the academic world in this area It's it will be confirming what the what the writers of the New Testament and the Gospels are saying for we have put but 1 Peter chap 
2 Peter chapter 1 verse 16 for we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ but were eyewitnesses of his majesty so scholarship is verifying that these writers are actually telling the truth 1 John chapter 1 verse 1 and 3 that which was from the beginning which we have heard which we have seen with our eyes which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life for the life was manifested and we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was with the father and was manifest unto us that which we have seen this is eyewitness material that which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that you also may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son Jesus Christ again another passage that emphasizes eyewitness material Luke chapter 1 verse 1 and 3 Luke chapter 1 verse 1 and 3 for as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us, even as they delivered them unto us from the beginning, were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of the things from the very first, to write unto thee in order most excellent Theophilus. So again, Luke is saying he's basing his material on eyewitness material exactly what a good historian of the time would do Acts chapter 1 Acts chapter 1 verse 1 to 3 the former treatise I have made O Theophilus of all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day in which he was taken up after that he through the Holy Ghost has given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs being seen of them forty days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God so Luke saying look I wrote a gospel based on what these apostles had seen eyewitness material verse 9 Acts chapter 1 verse 9 and when he had spoken these things while they beheld he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight Luke is writing what the disciples said they saw about Jesus extension 1 Corinthians 15 3 8 1 Corinthians 15 3 and 8 for I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures and that he was seen of Cephas then of the twelve and after that he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once of whom So Paul said the gospel is preaching was based on eyewitness material. John chapter 20. John chapter 20. Verse 30 to 31. Says many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have the th you might have life through him. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through him.
we read in Acts chapter 10 Acts chapter 10 verse 39 and 42 And we are witnesses of all things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. And he goes on in Acts chapter 2.22. Acts 2.22. You men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you as you yourselves also know. In other words, this was so eyewitness material, even the enemies of God knew what was going on. Acts 26, 24. Acts 26, 24. Acts 26, 24 to 28. We read, And he thus spoke for himself, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, thou art beside himself, much learning doth make thee mad. But he said, I am not mad, and most noble Festus, but speak forth the words of truth and soberness, for the king knoweth of these things, before whom also I speak freely, for I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him, for this thing was not done in a corner. In other words, saying, look, I am an eyewitness to this material, and you know that other people who were, who, who, who were enemies of, of this message also knew about this Jesus and what happened to him in dying and rising again. So that's quite a bit of te uh, information from the Bible there, showing you that they actually believed uh, eyewitness material was important. So we'll get back to Borkham's book, and uh, we're fin starting from page uh, 93. Borkham's book, uh, which was just the picture of the book, was just up there. And I uh, hope everybody's okay. Page 93. The fall critics did not think much of the information which the ancient church provides concerning the concrete persons behind the Gospels, not even of the, the personal... the persons related into the New Testament. The notion of the creative community makes questions of concrete traditions uninteresting. This depersonalization has had a contagious effect to the present. It still regularly happens that people speak of products of the church and of traditions circulated in the communities instead of asking who f has formulated or reformulated or transmitted a certain text, page 93. We've gone in a lot into fall criticism, but if you've ever studied at seminary level, or if you've ever been involved in academic university studies, um, you'll find that it's very hard as a student or a lecturer to get your mind around new ideas. And it's very hard to understand why Barkham has mentioned quite a bit about this fall critical school, because it ruled the academic world with an iron fist. So if you know a little bit about academia, you'll know why he's had to labour these points. What does this mean for those who are atheists? What it means for atheists is watch the space. <laughs> Your scholarship that you're using as atheists, most of it is 70 years behind the times, basically. I've not met, a Scot I've not met an atheist at the moment, whether it be scholar or atheist rank and file, I've not met any atheist yet who is up to speed on the academic scholarship uh, at the present time in historical studies concerning Jesus 
and is aware of what's going on and able to give a decent argument for their position. In fact, it's been absolutely woeful um, and it's been embarrassing to hear the atheist argue on the internet. Um, some of my friends who've been at seminary talking to them about what the atheists have been saying, we've, we've been shocked, absolutely shocked these last couple of years at what the atheists have been saying because it, it, they're just not rational, they're just they're just behind in their scholarship. I mean it's terrible. Um, and then when you give them good scholarship they they do intellectual terrorism by phoning you up and threatening you. <laughs> That's the level that they're at. But they're certainly not on a, a top academic level in terms of the scholarship. They won't engage with it. They don't know how to engage with it. They prefer to keep their mind back to 70 years ago where uh, to a scholarship that's fringe scholarship now and is outmoded. And that's why we have these dinosaurs like Richard Carrier and people like that going around trying to pump the their new improved Mithraism with a little bit of base theorem but it just doesn't do any good if you know your stuff you know that they're not talking right and they don't know what they're doing really and sadly to say that many of these atheists on the internet follow these atheist scholars and these atheist scholars have not got I'm, I'm telling you now they have got no idea about these subjects when it comes to the historical Jesus I would love to debate them but they they're, they're frightened they're frightened, they're absolutely frightened of getting into academic debates on these subjects, absolutely frightened, frightened to death. Like I said, the best that they can do is phone you up and threaten you. And This is top atheists who run, run blog shows encouraging this kind of nonsense. <laughs> top atheists t encouraging atheists to phone Christian apologists up to threaten them and they're encouraging that kind of behavior and they get away with it and everybody believes when they turn up on these blog shows and 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 discussing with you all this academic stuff that they think they're discussing which is often when it comes to Jesus studies 12, 70 years behind but when they do that or they talk about philosophy or even science there's a whole world behind them of people who follow them and they encourage who are cyber bullies attacking you and destroying you and they've destroyed a number of Christian apologists they in, inquire into Christian apologists financial life private life home situation phoning work up phoning your house up they're horrible and nobody's doing anything about it nobody's doing anything about it and it's a shame and I ask that if you know how to deal with these people then follow them around and I don't know how you can deal with them but try and help this to stop this cyberbullying because it goes on a lot with the atheist community it's rife in the atheist community on the internet it really is it's really really bad um, page 95 welcome that Jesus himself appointed 12 of his disciples for a special place in his mission of renewing and rest, restoring um, God's people Israel has been doubted by some scholars following the lead of Rudolf Bultmann who has opposed that notion of the 12 originated, originated only later however a large majority of recent scholars has accepted especially since it Cohere so well with the trend to understand Jesus as thoroughly Jew in thoroughly Jewish terms. Page ninety-five. Very significant comment that. Very significant if you know much about this kind of scholarship. Page ninety-five. The appointment of the twelve constitute, uh, as several scholars have argued, a prophetic sign of what God was doing in Jesus' ministry. Page ninety-five. So what Borkham's doing here is he's actually now saying right let, let, let's do proper history now let's get rid of this Bultman stuff let's go what it, what was it like in first century Judaism first century Judaism they had rabbis had disciples they had a group of disciples around them 
this was a Jewish kind of thing. It was also philosophers did it, but Jewish rabbis did it as well. So therefore, when it talks about in the Gospels, Jesus had 12 disciples, then that would be historically what it would be like in the time. <coughs> and um, thus authenticating the Gospels as, <coughs> as being of its time, and also undergirding Borkham's theory of individual oral tradition. I'm sorry for saying all this repetitively. It is not difficult to imagine that their role in the earliest Christian community would include that of authoritative transmissions of the sayings of Jesus. <coughs> Sorry. It is not difficult to imagine that their role in the earliest Christian community would include that of authoritative transmission. If the Lord had 12 disciples, it's not hard to understand that they would pass on information about Jesus. Excuse me. Let's go to Matthew ten two four. Matthew Matthew uh, chapter ten verse two and four. Matthew ten two and four. And now the names of the twelve apostles are these: the first, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee. And John his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas, Matthew, Publican, James the son of Alphaeus, um, etc. So, Barkham goes into detail. You can look at if you look at Matthew chapter ten verse two and four, Mark chapter three verse sixteen and to nineteen, Luke chapter six verse thirteen to sixteen, and Acts chapter one verse thirteen. What that does is show you that there are four traditions, four historical pieces of evidence to show that Jesus had these 12 disciples. If that is, if that is the case, that is strong historical attestation that that is the case. That gives uh, credence to Barkham's theory that there were these individuals who had authoritative control of passing on the eyewitness material very significant and he goes into detail and in the arguments the academic in, uh, arguments for uh, why he thinks that's the case there are some arguments against and for and it's very detailed and you can read page 101 page 102 uh, some very significant details and some significant objections to that argument that you would need to go and look at if you wanted more detail and I think read up to page 122 Then Borkham goes uh, into his book um, and talks about inclusion. Now, the inclusion was the one of the ways uh, ancient writers of uh, ancient historians, excuse me, uh, wrote. They would have um, pieces of information. Uh, pieces of uh, sections of a person's life that they would bring in to expand. So they would have the birth of a, a writer, uh, of a, a, a person, uh, the middle of the person, and the death of the person. And then in between, they would have themes uh, of wanting to explore certain themes. And part of that is inclusion. Is what is called inclusion, and uh, Borkham goes into detail how in the Gospel of Mark there are these literary devices that Roman and Greek historians use that you can find in the Gospels. Um, maybe if you go to page one thirty one in his book, you'll find this, and he also talks in page one thirty seven of Lucian's Life of Alexander and uh, Proferre's Life of Plotinus, who, who has these kind of uh, literary devices. And they are very similar to the way the Gospels are written.
page 148, Mark has named persons in the Gospel of Mark. Again, verifying um, uh, verifying that this is eyewitness material. These specific names were part of this whole theory of individual, get this, individual, individual, specific individuals who are the custodians of the oral tradition. This is part of that evidence that he's trying to show you that why is it there are these individual names mentioned within these Gospels? Could it not be that they are significant and important and have some authority also in passing on the tradition? Also that these individuals would have been known by why name people unless they were known by other people? Do you get it? Just think about that for a minute. Uh, in, uh, Balcom talks about a neglected article in, in 1925 by Cuthbert Turner. Um, so have a look at that. That's an important article. Uh, Balcom talks about internal focalization. Internal focalization, page 163. Studies of point of view in Mark have missed the plural to singular narrative device characteristic though it is of Mark's gospel it is a form of internal focalization which as we agreed endears the readers to view the incident that follows from the perspective of the disciple who arrived on the scene with Jesus so this internal focalization is another piece of evidence to the jigsaw that this is actually eyewitness material. It's a brilliant thesis, don't you think? It's an absolute brilliant thesis. So what he's saying is the fact that there are individuals, for example, in the Gospel of Mark, Peter is often, there's internal focalization going on a lot in the Gospel of Mark concerning Peter. In other words, it's seems to be looking at a lot of um, what's happening in the Gospel of Mark from Peter's perspective. So internal focalization going on concerning Peter in the Gospel of Mark. The amazing thing is we know from tradition that Peter was involved by helping Mark to write that Gospel. So internal focalization in the Gospel shows you that there are these authoritative oral traditions that are being expressed within these Gospels. Authoritative oral tradition connected to individuals who were, in quotes, eyewitness accounts. Okay. Okay. So, uh, internal focalization is an important aspect of uh, Borkham's um, uh, method of, of proving his point. Uh, I'll just turn to John 15 26. Uh, uh. It's not relevant, sorry about that. Josephus. He mentions Josephus, page 120. We've come to the end here now. He mentions Josephus, page 120. I, on the contrary, have written a, ver a veracious account at one comprehensive and detailed of the war having been present in person at all the events. That's Josephus, page 120. I think the reason the reason why Borkham, I think it's, I've got Josephus, page 120, so I don't know if that's reference to Borkham or Josephus, and then I have page 147. 
So check if it's Borkham page 147 or 120 or Josephus page 120, 147 but either one of those references is to Josephus, one to Borkham. Sorry about that. Uh, but Josephus says, I, on the contrary, have written a veracious account, veracious account, at one comprehensive and detailed of the war having been present in person at all the events. That is what Borkham has been saying all along, is that these ancient historians like Josephus, who lived in the time of the Gospel writers, believed that it's important to have eyewitness material. So why would an atheist, if they're intelligent or a skeptic, knows that Josephus and historians in the time of Jesus wanted eyewitness material, why would they pick up the Gospel of Luke or Matthew or Mark or John and not think that they were writing in the same vein? It's historically unfair and historically anti-intellectual. So there we are. We've we've done a hundred and we've looked at briefly about up to a hundred and eighty pages of Borkham's book. That's nearly half of the book. It's about five hundred pages. Um. So I think what we'll do now is we'll just listen to a little bit more clips and um, maybe related to. Um, a few of the atheist scholars around and just debunk them for a minute using this stuff by Borkham but we'll, we'll listen to a, li a little bit more of Borkham here we'll listen to this for five ten minutes and then I'll debunk some of the scholars atheist scholars that might object to this in the strict sense in which the ancients often defined it this, I think, need not bring Biersko's argument into conflict with Barrage's, because I think we're in the area precisely of the overlapping of historiography and biography. And the fact that Biersko can write a very illuminating book comparing the Gospels with ancient historians, historiography, and uh, Barrage could do exactly the same for biography, I think con 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 confirms the idea that really Gospels are in there at the overlap of these two uh, genres. And also the point that I've uh, mentioned before I think is very important, that therefore historiographical practice, which is mostly what Biersko is concerned with, how you wrote history, how you research and wrote history in the ancient world, historiographical practice um, would very easily Morning. cross what the boundary and be expected also of biographies, especially contemporary biographies, uh, where eyewitness testimony uh, is available. Okay. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to put some of the atheist scholars on now. I'm going to listen to them for five minutes and then using this Dr. Borkham scholarship. We're going to uh, take these atheist scholars apart. All right. I haven't got all my notes. I've just got my Borkham notes here. But I've got a ton of notes there. So let's just put these atheists on. And uh, let's do the business. Let's uh, see if they can stand up to scr critical scrutiny when we use this Borkham scholarship. Okay. I've given you a a bit of a groundwork, so let's see what happens when we put these atheist scholars um, on. So I'm going to make a few notes. So watch what happens when we use good scholarship against atheist scholars who attack our position. Watch what happens. Okay. I just got my notes here because this is off the cuff. I've not actually uh, not actually uh, 
listen to the specific di discussion by okay this is an atheist scholar did Jesus exist by Richard Carrier out to watch is so controversial some of Britain's leading media outlets have banned it is a whole paragraph in the early Jewish historian Josephus which nearly everybody agrees was snuck into that book by a later Christian scribe who was evidently annoyed that Josephus forgot to mention Jesus so when he copied the book out he made sure to you know just add a paragraph you generally don't have to add paragraphs to other people's history books for a guy who actually existed pretty much if you're inserting a guy into history who wasn't there before I can? Okay. Everything I do up here makes a sound. Okay. Uh, yes. Did Jesus exist? It's actually a tougher question than most people think. Now, I won't really be answering that question today. I'm just going to give you some food for thought. And with a qualification, uh, a lot of what I'm going to talk about today is tongue-in-cheek. But like the great philosopher Al Franken once said, I'm kidding on the square. So I begin with a, quoting an ancient document. It's an ancient document, I quote. On the day before the Passover, they hanged Jesus. A herald went before him for 40 days, proclaiming, he will be stoned because he practiced magic and enticed Israel to go astray. Let anyone who knows anything in his favor come forward and for him. But nothing was found in his favor, and they hanged him on the day before the Passover. That's what the Talmud says. If any of you know uh, how the story goes in the New Testament, you might notice the two accounts don't exactly agree. Here Jesus is stoned, not crucified, and by Jews, not Romans, and was in custody for 40 days, not over a single night, and he was executed for sorcery and enticing people to follow other gods, not for blasphemy, and yet that passage is really the best evidence for Jesus that we have outside the New Testament, and it comes only centuries later. So you either have to conclude that there is no reliable evidence outside the New Testament, or that the New Testament itself is full of shit. That, uh, I kid you not, is the most gross, pathetic, historical analysis that you could ever hear in your life. It really is so bad, that's why the guy won't debate me. <laughs> well, that is a very, very bad uh, historical inquiry. In the Talmud, um, it's written by Jews, that, and they have their own particular agenda, um, and the Christians have their agenda, and the Jews are twisting and saying certain things that suit them. But there are some similarities to this issue about Jesus and what happened to him. Um, it's obvious that in the Talmud, Jesus is a threat. Uh, that comes out of the writing that verifies the New Testament. So making a disparity between the Talmud and just and um, and uh, the Gospel account um, is really bad history. Every historian knows that every history, all history is biased and so every historian when they're writing will put the material they want to concentrate on for their specific reason. Now that doesn't mean to say that we can't get to the objective history but it just means that you've got to recognize that and so when you get disparity between some historians it's only because it doesn't necessarily mean because they're contradictory it just means that they have a different agenda now anyone with a 101 in history would know this but this man Richard Carrier I kid you not is a very very poor historian to say the least and um, it's a shame that people are listening to this kind of scholarship that is fringe scholarship and very poor and misrepresentative to the public. Now granted, there are earlier references.
they are uh, even better and well attested. So again, this man doesn't know his scholarship at all. He really doesn't. They either just repeat what Christians were telling them, uh, Christians who were just riffing on the New Testament, or they are actually fabricated by Christians themselves. And the most famous example is a whole paragraph in the early Jewish historian Josephus, which nearly everybody agrees was snuck into that book by a later Christian scribe, who was evidently annoyed that Josephus forgot to mention Jesus. This guy is so dishonest. Are you re honestly, he really is dishonest and misrepresenting the academic world and the academic scholarship at the present time on Josephus. The Josephus passage that talks about Jesus dying under Pontius Pilate is reckoned to have been partly interpolated around about the fourth century. This interpretation is a minor interpolation and there is generally believed by most scholars that there is a core of historical truth about Jesus within the Josephus passage. I've read uh, much of Josephus work and analyze the text myself and I found that the Josephus passage is classic Josephus after analyzing most of Josephus writing uh, historical writing but whether I say that or not is irrespective of the fact that the vast majority of scholars would say that the, there is a historical core in Josephus that talks about Jesus dying under Pontius Pilate so Dr. Carrier is misrepresenting, honestly he is misrepresenting the, scholar, the scholarship on this and as you as atheist should, should really open your eyes and realize you're being lied to by this, by this man and by these kind of atheists. You really are being lied to. So when he copied the book out he made sure to, you know, just add a paragraph. You generally don't have to add paragraphs to other people's history books for a guy who actually existed. Pretty much if you're inserting a guy into history who wasn't there before, usually that means he really wasn't there before. Now that leaves it... Again, this is very poor. It's not even poor, it's just beyond a joke, really. Like I said, there's been a minor interpolation not adding a full paragraph. This is just ridiculous. Um, and he fails to mention that there is another passage within Josephus that mentions Jesus Christ and the Lord's brother okay so there's actually two passages there and the first passage that mentions the Lord's brother uh, that is seen as one of To back this up, we'll see. It's just with the New Testament. In that, the oldest books are the epistles, or some of the epistles. So he makes these comments about Josephus, but provides no any no historical information to be able to verify this. No scholarly articles or anything that can verify it. I've given you scholarly material. I've given you Barkham's book, and you can go investigate that book, and you can look at his bibliography. This guy gives no scholarly references. They don't really tell us anything about Jesus outside of visions and stylized creeds. The letters of Paul are the earliest of all. Uh, a psychologist friend of mine described them so well, uh, I'm just, I just have to quote him uh, at his request anonymously. I quote, Imagine for a moment that one of your friends writes you a 20-page letter passionately wanting to share his excitement about a new teacher. This letter has only one topic, your friend teacher. Yet by the end of his letter, after all 20 pages of it, you still don't know one thing about his teacher. Paul presents the central figure of his theology in just this way. For those of us not lost in delusional worlds, it might seem impossible to imagine how Paul could avoid telling even one story or parable, or fail to note one physical trait or personal quality of Jesus. But Paul's lack of interest in or even curiosity about the life of this Jesus does fit a characteristic pattern of paranoid delusions. End quote. So the epistles are no good. I move. Uh, again, gross generalization there and lack of scholarship. The guy is influenced by Earl Doherty, who uh, wrote a book called Jesus Puzzle. So this scholar, Richard Carey, who's a major atheist scholar on the 
historical Jesus studies and whatever he's influenced principally by a guy called Earl Doughty who wrote the book Jesus Puzzle Uh, the Turbigan School says that Paul didn't even write the, the letters of Paul. Uh, so basically, this Jesus puzzle guy, Earl Doughty, he is not a qualified scholar. He has not got an educated post in a university. And he's just rehashing these old theories. Now, no scholar of repute, of repute holds these kind of theories that Carrie has done. Now, I understand what I'm doing here is using an argument from authority. But let's back it up with some evidence. First of all, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is well known to have gone back to AD, around about AD 55. We also know that because of the Greek words that he's using of first importance, that mimics the kind of oral tradition that was around uh, around about AD Now to say that Paul was not interested in any individual facts and in life of Jesus is just ridiculous. Uh, Paul mentions about uh, mentions um, the main issues. He mentions the death, and he mentions the resurrection of Jesus. And his main application is to apply that teaching to his own life and everybody else's life. He knows that there are others who are writing Gospels and they are putting the historical information about what Jesus said and did. Paul's job was to apply the life of Jesus to the church, his life and mission. But that doesn't mean to say that Paul left out information about Jesus. There's actually a lot of information about Jesus within the epistles. Um, so I, I just mentioned that for example um, the Lord's Supper uh, Paul quotes in Corinthians 1 Corinthians the exact words of Jesus alright so that's debunking carrier but there's other factual information about Jesus in Paul's epistles um, and the main thing is that Jesus died on a cross and rose again and Paul's epistles are supremely important because even the critics will grant you, and this is important to you, Dominic Crossan is a critic, and many other critics will grant you at least seven of Paul's epistles as being written by Paul and as early historical information. So they are not useless. They're even seen by critics as important for understanding early Christianity. And so Carrier's comments are very, very bad and, and show a bad life for you atheists that you have scholars like this who are not capable of actually engaging at a heavy academic weight in a fair honest way. Right. What do we have left? Well, the Gospels. But those tell stories about a God-man who teaches lessons, goes on adventures, suffers a terrible death, and then rises from the grave to become a god. Which is actually a story that had already been told a dozen times already. It was actually more popular a story than television crime dramas are now. If they had TV back then, Instead of ten different spin-offs of Law and Order, you'd see ten different spin-offs of Son of God. A typical TV Guide entry would read like this. Yet another resurrected Son of God tells people to get their shit together and is killed for his trouble, but rises from the grave and ascends to heaven to get his future revenge on their mortal souls. There would have been Son of God, the rise of Romulus. Son of God, the adventures of Hercules. Son of God, Bacchus edition. And and Son of God, the Osiris Chronicles, and half a dozen more. We're pretty sure none of those guys existed at all. So when we hear about one more of those guys, but then his followers insist, oh, no, 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 our resurrected Savior, our resurrected Son of God, he really existed, honest. You might start to get suspicious. There are reasons to be suspicious. 
Just imagine a bunch of cultists running around now insisting, oh no, our Indiana Jones is the real thing, and he loves you, he said. Anyway, in this spin-off, Son of God, JC, we hear about a sanctimonious Jew named Jesus, which very suspiciously means Savior, who has an amazing birth and goes around teaching people all the crazy things they have to do, or else invisible armies will soon descend from outer space and kill them all. And this pisses off everybody in charge, so the Jews haul him in and somehow manage to convince the local Roman police chief, Pontius Pilate, to have this guy executed for some inadequately explored reason. Then his body disappears from his grave, and he comes back with further instructions on how to avoid the coming space armies. That's actually the gist of the story. But there's all kinds of crazy weird stuff in it. Like, for example, and I think this was mentioned earlier today, a star that floats around the Middle East and hovers over a barn in Bethlehem. But no one notices this star except some Iranian dudes, with a mysterious wad of disposable cash and nothing better to do but follow weird stars around. For months on... Okay, this is one of the top scholars. And uh, notice the, the language that he's using. It's not scholarly language, it's esoteric language uh, out to demonize the particular argument that he's actually arguing against. He's not actually using scholarly uh, terminology and language in deconstructing the Gospels and the New Testament. Um, he talks about the dying and rising gods. Uh, uh, and that this is was taught in Jesus' time. First of all, um, notice he provided no evidence. He made an assertion. He said, there are these dies and rising gods, Jesus was the same as them. Well, first of all, the other religions with the so-called dying and rising gods, resurrection in Greek thinking is not the same as resurrection in Jewish thinking. Mm, that should make you think. Resurrection in Jewish thinking is not the same as Egyptian thinking. So in other words, to try and say they're all similar is just not true. Uh, when you talk about the dying and rising gods of Greece, what do you mean by dying and rising? It's not the same as the Jewish dying and rising, the physical death of a the body and the body being erected is not the same as in Greek theology or mythology. So it's crass understanding of religion in the ancient world uh, smashed together to give some kind of theory that tries to debunk Christianity but actually lacks no historical value, has no historical integrity or value. I actually have said this a number of times, read many ancient hymns to find out about these so-called dying and rising gods and they don't exist. It actually does not exist. Um, I think it was the Orpheus hymns, the 90 Orphic hymns that I read. I couldn't find anything about the dying and rising gods. And uh, Greek, I read the Book of Dead of the of the Egyptians and there's nothing about dying and rising gods uh, remotely similar to uh, Christianity. Um, Plutarch's essay, which is a key essay in understanding these ancient religions, says nothing about dying and rising gods the same as Christianity. So whichever way you look at it, looking at the ancient hymns, looking at the literary writings of these ancient religions, looking at um, even historians who were commentating on these ancient writers in ancient times, there's nothing to substantiate what Carrie is saying, so it's only fringe scholarship. And all the rest of the language he's using is just um, a bias towards the supernatural. Rather than be biased, he should be open just to investigate the material, but he's already got a bias against the supernatural, the way he's using the language, saying about these dudes followed the stars and all the rest of it. Uh, um. On end, by the way, they walked all the way from Iran to Israel. So you got to be really hard up about this frickin' star. <laughs> no one also seems to bother asking why this star didn't melt the Earth. Um, I guess it was a cool star. 
And no one asks why only three Iranian guys could see it. I mean, we could speculate, I suppose, that they had some really good reefer over there. Well, you know, the darkness uh, everybody saw, they mentioned, uh, Thalas, a historian, mentioned the darkness when Christ was crucified and it went dark. There was a historian called Thalas in 55 AD that mentioned this darkness. So, um, you know, what more do you want? I'm going to leave Carry. I, I, I find him nauseating. I think he thinks he's smart. And I, I find his scholarship pretty poor. So that's one of the top scholars, as you can see. Very easy to dig. The scholarship by Dr. Borkham or any of the scholars that we have. Have you noticed that? He's not actually listening to what other scholars are saying and responding to them. He's got his own opinion, his own agenda, uh, and that's the way it is. Whereas if you notice with me, when I did my video today, we did look at at least what one atheist said. We gave an atheist an opportunity who discussed with Borkham a chance to give his view. All right. Did you notice that this guy, this scholar, Carrie, we, we don't hear any other scholars he mentions that disagree with him and how he's interacted with them. So let's go for Charles Price, uh, Robert Price. Right. Uh, we'll see where we go. Go for this. Good evening. I'd like to personally thank everybody for coming out tonight. My name is Scott Butes, and I'll be your host for the evening. So this is Dr. Price. Uh, he's the. He, he's not an atheist, but he is a scholar that atheists like to use. Okay. So we'll hear what he has to say. We like each other. Yeah. Please welcome Dr. Price. You know, uh, if Larry King really did interview him, you know, the question he'd really ask is, what was it like working with Simon Peter? Uh, not exactly my favorite. Anyway, uh, one, one little uh, correction. I uh, uh, abdicated my illustrious position as uh, director of the New York Center of the Center for Inquiry a while ago. I, I still consider myself a humanist, like my pal Jim Underdown back there, but I also, uh, in a kind of paradoxical mode am a church-going Episcopalian. I just am no longer uh, orthodox or evangelical in faith, though I used to be. I was uh, for a while a president of a student uh, chapter of InterVarsity Christian Fellowship. I went to Campus Crusade and got training in the four spiritual laws and later wrote a satire of it called Have You Heard of Five Calvinist Laws, uh, at the end of which you, you find out that you're one of the uh, predetermined reprobate to be damned, and you sign a little certificate, say, I accept eternal hell is my lot. I'm like, oh, anyway, uh, but um, I, I, I have, uh, what I want to tell you tonight is, is not exactly kind of a negative assessment of who I think Jesus was or was not, but the reasons for the virtual agnosticism that I hold about the question uh, to me, the Christ of faith and the Jesus of history are different things, both fascinating in very different ways, though. And uh, you can look at uh, the way I view uh, the menu of the options for the historical Jesus. If you can wade through my book, Deconstructing Jesus, that's uh, available at Amazon or whatever. Got another one coming out uh, at the end of this year from uh, Prometheus Books, also called The Incredible Shrinking Son of Man, which tries to show how we know less and less and less than scholars used to think. 
Well, evangelical apologists repudiate the notion that the Gospels contain legendary or fictitious material about Jesus Christ. They want to be able to believe he did and said everything attributed to him in the Gospels. They always use the same arguments, including the importance of the short time span between Jesus and the writing of the Gospels and the centrality of eyewitnesses in the formation of the Gospel tradition. Such factors are said to make it unlikely, if not impossible, for the Gospels to contain fabricated or legendary material. For instance, Josh McDowell says, or whoever got to write this paragraph, somebody in the book said, uh, one of the major criticisms against the form critic's idea of the oral tradition is that the period of oral tradition as defined by the critics is not long enough to have allowed the alterations in the tradition that the radical critics have alleged. And a quote. Similarly, John Warwick Murray asserts, quote, with the small time interval between Jesus' life and the gospel records, the church did not create a Christ of faith. And a quote, this small time interval, even according to the most conservative estimate of gospel dating, would have to be about 30 or 40 years. Apologists protest that this is not really a long period at all. As McNeil says, quote, it is not usual, I'm sorry, it is not unusual for men even of slight intellectual ability to recall and relate clearly important events occurring 35 years previously. But surely that's not the point. Critics suggest not so much that eyewitnesses forgot the details of what they saw. <laughs> I forget, Peter, did Jesus walk on water or was he water skiing? Yeah, no, uh, now, the question is whether other people saw uh, very little to nothing about Jesus and then spun out legendary meal during those years, as, as uh, D.F. Strauss suggested, people uh, who had little to remember and tried to just fill in the gaps of their knowledge. But if the, apost if the apologists are right, records of similar religious figures written within a comparable time span should also be free of legendary embellishment. Well, are they? What do we find? This is what really began to crack my confidence in the apologetical edifice. Uh, Gershom Scholem's study of the 17th century messianic pretender, Sabbatai Svi, provides a good parallel here. Sabbatai Svi was able to arouse apocalyptic fervor among Jews all over the Mediterranean during the 1660s. The movement suffered a serious setback when the Messiah renounced Judaism under the gun and turned to Islam. He thought a crucified Christ was a bitter pill to swallow. But uh, the movement did not die survives him. Well, here too, according to the apologists, legend should have waited at least a couple of generations till they reared their ugly heads. But Sholem speaks of, quote, the sudden and almost explosive surge of miracle stories, unquote, concerning Sabbatai Sabi within weeks or even days of his public appearances. Listen to this description by Sholem. The realm of imaginative legend soon dominated the mental climate in Palestine while Sabbatai Sabi was there. The, the sway of imagination was strongly in evidence in letters sent to Egypt and elsewhere, and which, by the autumn of 1665, the same year, had assumed the character of regular messianic propaganda in which fiction far outweighed the facts. For instance, the prophet was encompassed with a fiery cloud, and the voice of an angel was heard from the cloud. Garments or to a hair on his head, end of quote. Other letters tell of his raising the dead. He is said to have left his prison through locked and barred doors, which opened by themselves after his chains miraculously broke. He kills a group of highwaymen merely with the word of his mouth. Interestingly, the miracle stories often conform to the patterns of contemporary saints' legends, just as Strauss theorized that the gospel miracle stories are often based on Old Testament tales of Moses, Elijah, and Elisha. 
literary prototypes were ready to hand, so it needn't have taken long at all for legends to pop up. Same thing happened earlier to Yehuda, the Hasid who died in 1217. In his own lifetime, legends made him a great magician, though in fact Yehuda was a staunch opponent of magic. Skipping ahead, 20th century African prophet Simon Kimbangu, uh, who started the largest denomination in, in the Congo even today. He became another living legend despite his own wishes. One group of his followers spread his fame as the God of the Blacks or Christ of the Blacks, even while Kimbangu himself, languishing in prison, disavowed the role. Legends of his childhood, his miracles, and his prophetic visions began within his own generation. Okay, we've uh, listened to what uh, Dr. Price has to say. And so what's my response to Dr. Price? Well, first of all, uh, I did an analysis and study of all the messianic pretenders from the time of Jesus up to the present time. Uh, what you find is that 99.9% of them were either crackpots or had agendas like, like financial, sexual, political agendas, or they were just crazy. In other words, they were all they were all fakes, and it was quite clear to see that. So you can't put these messianic pretenders. Um, each one of them has their own different um, spin, right? And you have to look at each one in their own context to try and say there are similarities between Jesus and these other uh, messianic pretenders is, is false. The second thing is to say that that legend can happen uh, very quickly within a generation. Um, he was very vague in his detail. He said letters. He didn't tell us who the individuals were and how they were connected to the particular messianic pretender. He never said any detail. He never gave us any detail. I'll ask this question. Show me these messianic pretenders having four Gospels. Show me that they have four Gospels based on eyewitness material. And they will not. So what we're saying is, you know, Christianity is unique. It's different. There is a, a variety of historical testimony. Not only in the Gospels do we have eyewitness material, but we have material outside the Gospels, historical material that verifies the Gospels. So it's in a completely different category than these Messianic pretenders. Okay. Um, the other thing is, you you he's making a, a fallacy there, a logical fallacy. He's saying that because one religion was like this, therefore all religions are going to be like this. If if um, there was myth in the time of Jesus, and therefore there's going to be myth in other religions, or and we can look at other religions, see myth, and therefore it's the same in 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 Christianity. That's a logical fallacy. That doesn't follow. You've got to be able to demonstrate that very detailed and accurately and he's not done that. Uh, for example there is massive differences between uh, African mess messianic pretenders and Jesus. For example when Jesus uh, prophesied that he would die on a cross when he died on a cross the disciples psychologically were were crushed. They were completely destroyed. They were not expecting a uh, resurrection then they are preaching the resurrection in Jerusalem. So we have two historical facts there that we can verify. One, that the Messiah, that these disciples were crushed and down and depressed. And two, they were preaching in Jerusalem. Now what's the significance of that? Two significant points. Number one, when they're preaching Jesus rose from the dead, they, they, it was not something that they were wanting to look for and invent. It, it, it didn't come to them because they were so crushed and disappointed. 
And if you're saying, well, yeah, they were Christians dis disappointed, so they invented this resurrection to make themselves better, then again, you're failing to understand the historical context. Jews believed in a physical, real resurrection. Uh, most Jews, or Judaism generally, believed in a physical resurrection, generally. There's different nuances of Judaism. But there was a belief in a physical resurrection. And Paul was a Pharisee. They believed in physical resurrection. And, you know, Orthodox Jews believed in a physical resurrection. I mean, I know you had Sadducees and the rest who didn't. But there were generally a belief in a physical resurrection. So they wouldn't have been going around inventing a myth that Jesus rose from the dead. Unless they'd literally seen it. The other thing is the preaching in Jerusalem. Why would they preach? an imaginary resurrection when the authorities could have stamped them down and said no the body's in the tomb and proved it wrong and proved them wrong so the historical context of Christianity is different from the historical context of African spirituality of some messianic followers who say that say whatever okay there's a different thing different thing going on there and Jesus of Nazareth has influenced history more than any other person in history. African pretenders and all these messianic people, they come and go, their followers come and go. They might some of them uh, some of these African ones might have lots of followers now, but they in no way have the worldwide impact that Jesus had. And so there is a massive difference. So there we are. Those are my thoughts. So those two, one atheist and one skeptical scholar, and uh, we're just going to finish now with a little bit of Borkum and um, I know no, we'll, we'll go for uh, I'm getting tired. I think uh, we'll just have a, a little bit of Borkum. Sorry about this. I'm going to finish off in a minute. We'll have a little bit of this, and then. Um, uh, so I think the resurrection is is in, is in a remarkable category. It's an exceptional event on any terms, um, both because of what Christian said about it, and also because of the uh, role that it plays in the actual beginning of the Christian movement. The resurrection is exceptional, um, and if and it, to accept what the early Christians said it meant, of course, you've got to buy into the early Christian worldview. I, I take that. And if you come with different worldviews, your attitude to the evidence is going to be different. I, I think if I were not a Christian, I'd, I'd have to say something extraordinary happened and I don't know what it was. Mm. Uh, it doesn't seem to me that it's susceptible to other explanations. Um, uh, so I, I, I think all I'm saying is that all historians faced with these kinds of um, uh, witness uh, to, 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 to things that can't be easily explained um, need a bit of humility. It's an interesting facet of the resurrection accounts that when it comes to eyewitness, women are the, the primary eyewitnesses in every account. Um, I mean, that a lot has been made of that, you know, as being, you know, in an ironic way, a great supporter of the the, the, the case for the resurrection. In as much as at the time they'd been wanting to make a case for something that was not the, not true, they wouldn't have chosen to make women their primary, uh, uh, if you like, defendants of it. Um, I mean, do, how how much does the issue of women's uh, testimony come into Jesus and the eyewitnesses. Do, do, you, do you put that in a special category in terms of where, if they were setting down things that women were saying, would they have had in their mind at the time, oh, people aren't going to believe this if I say that Mary said it or, or that sort of thing? I mean, yes. I, I mean no, actually the, 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 the pagan critic of Christianity, Celsus, in the second century, I mean, he's the, we only have excerpts of what he said. Um, in Origins reply to him, but he's the first 
uh, pagan critic that we have of Christianity, and he says at one point, you know, you're asking us to believe what a hysterical woman said. Um, and there was, I think, this general suspicion of women, especially in religious matters, that they were gullible. Um, so I think I, I'm less inclined to make a lot of the idea of whether wi wi women's witness counted in court um, in, in a Jewish context. I mean, some people make a lot of that. I, I, I'm not sure that is as relevant as the general sense that women were gullible and liable in, in religious matters. And also um, that um, women ought not to be the recipients of revelation. You know? mm -hmm. The whole idea of you know the, the role of men in in uh, in the Jewish tradition, you know, that women are not the recipients of revelation, which is why in, you know in Luke, uh, the women come to the apostles and the apostles don't believe them. They think it's nonsense. You know, um, the two disciples on the way to Emmaus is just an idle tale that the, these women told. You know, they just dismiss it. So the gospels are quite explicit about you know this is not good evidence. Uh, so I think that is a, a an odd fact of the evidence that such an important role is given to the women. Um. What what do you make then of, of all this, James? Because does this ultimately pose a serious problem for R Richard's theory? Because um, ultimately, his key or it was. You know, could could be seen in some other light, presumably. Um, where do you go with that? Well, I, I wouldn't put it in such stark terms. I have a kind of uh, methodological indifference about certain things, and when it comes to the reality behind the resurrection scene, then, you know, I, I'm really not fussed at all in one sense. Um, I mean, I think Richard said it. I've said it uh, on this program. Uh, we know something happened. We know. That there were witnesses to something or other happening, and I, I, I mean, this is where, where I did disagree with Michael Bird last time. He was seen to me to be insistent on trying to prove it really happened, and I said, "Well, why don't we just agree that something dramatic happened, and it was important for Christian origins and what happened next, and so on and so forth." And there were certainly uh, witnesses, eyewitnesses, people had these visions. We can all agree on that, and uh, we can move on. I mean, we can we can take their testimony at first hand as well. You know, that we think. You know, Jesus was raised and so on. Great. Um, that can help us in historical explanation. I don't think uh, there's much but potential. It doesn't mean that we haven't got reliable eyewitnesses, though. I mean, is that what it means if, if people oh. are claiming that this this is no. that stuff happened? No, not necessarily. Um, I mean, it, well, I mean, it depends. Uh, if you, I, mean, I would want to re uh, discuss the uh, resurrection stories again in terms of something like storytelling or something like that. It could be viewed in those terms potentially. Uh, in terms of just the you know resur appearances, resurrection appearances. Um, well, I wouldn't. I, I think it's a stronger piece of evidence for eyewitness testimony we've probably got in the New Testament, uh, and for, you know, and, and we'd have to say it's reliable. They saw something. They believe this to be the case. So I think it's a, that's it. Also, a problem. We'll, we'll come back to this in a moment uh, as we take a short break. Here, we're talking about Jesus and the eyewitnesses as we uh, we look again now and uh, at the book that uh, Richard Borkham wrote and uh, won the Ramsey Prize uh, this year. And uh, as we ask about the testimony that uh, Richard believes. So we'll just finish a um, couple more minutes with um, this lecture. But let's go back again to what sort of biography is it? There have been various attempts, I mentioned one or two of them, to specify what sort of biography. If we go for the sort of figure, if we try and distinguish by the kind of biography, and clearly this is a very significant aspect of how different biographies differ. Some people, I think, have been rather quick to think that biographies of philosophers are the closest analogy um, to the Gospels. Um, Biographies of figures often um, give you uh, quite a lot of information about the philosopher's teaching, and even quote the philosopher's teachings in the way that the Gospels do. So at first sight, that's quite a, an appealing comparison. 
But I think the differences between the Gospels and philosophical biographies are quite significant. And it is much more plausible, I think, to see Jesus as a unique figure among the biographies of antiquity, rather than associating him, associating the Gospels too closely um, with biographies of, of um, philosophers. Um, and as I said, this is not a One of those came up with, uh, if someone came up with one of those. Um, so a biography of a unique figure, such as Jesus, um, or a figure that resembles other, a variety of other figures, rather than being in a particular category, that kind of uh, understanding of who Jesus was um, could still be easily accommodated within the genre of biography. Well now, let me now turn to some important features of the Gospels um, that we haven't yet considered and which tend not to be considered in the kind of discussion that I've pursued so far. And this section is called, the last main section of the lecture, it's called the Gospels as Biblical History. And the two aspects I want to talk about here are first of all Christology as a key element in the Gospels and secondly the relationship of the Gospels to the history that's narrated in the Old Testament Hebrew Bible. So think first about Christology. Whatever various scholars might think of the historical Jesus, by the way, and I'm not concerned here with the historical Jesus, I'm concerned with the Jesus as he's portrayed in, in the Gospels. Um, and, but, but whatever, therefore, scholars may think of the historical Jesus, in none of the Gospels is Jesus merely a wise teacher, or even merely a wise teacher who is actually close to the divine and can perform miracles. The Jesus of the Gospels is the Messiah, the Son of God the Son of God, not a Son of God, as maybe the his centurion in Mark's account of the crucifixion concludes, but the unique Son of God, who is the unique Messiah, the one who comes to implement the rule of God in Israel and in the world. Now, by identifying Jesus as the Messiah, the Gospels place their stories within a strong meta-narrative provided by the Old Testament, the grand narrative that runs through the Hebrew Bible from Genesis onwards. With the arrival of the Messiah foretold by the prophets, this grand narrative, grand historical narrative of events in the Old Testament comes to a climax. So the Gospels understand themselves, I think, to be continuing and bringing to its climax the biblical history of God's purpose for Israel. Israel of the world. It's actually important to stress the fact that in the expectation of the Hebrew prophets, the future blessing of Israel was to be also salvation for the nations. It's an Israel-centered expectation, but it's also an expectation of salvation that will go out from Israel to the world. As the Messiah who fulfills this expectation, who comes to implement God's rule in its eschatological reality, Jesus is by definition unique, and also by definition of significance for the whole world. So in some sense, very, very important and central sense, the Gospels do present Jesus as a unique figure, um, and one who is relevant to all possible leaders. And nothing resembling that could be said of any of the other individuals who are subjects of the other Greek-Roman biographies. 
Not even Alexander the Great, who perhaps comes closest to the kind of universal significance of the figure of Jesus. So, I'm going to finish in a minute. Um, basically, we've been looking at this book, uh, thinking about the relevance of this book. Uh, like I said, I don't agree fully with Borkham. Uh, I don't think he believes in inerrancy of scripture, but I'm just saying that this book is dynamite in giving solid evidence for eyewitness material in the Gospels, which gives you a strong base then to argue for the historicity of the resurrection and miracles, etc. So that's what we've been looking at tonight. And then we, near the end, we just had a look at some of the atheists, uh, one atheist scholar, and uh, an agnostic scholar and just picked them apart and showed how their scholarship doesn't do justice to to these questions and you've had a long four hour session of unpacking the book by Borkham himself or by me reading his book and commentating and it's all because of this I want to read this uh, and then I'm going to close in prayer in John 19, the Pilate, then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him. And the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in purple robe. They came up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and struck him with their hands. Pilate went out and again said to them, See, I am bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, Behold the man. When the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him, crucify him. And Pilate said to them, Take him yourself and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law he ought to die, because he has made himself the Son of God. When Pilate heard the statement, he was even more afraid, and he entered his headquarters again and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer and said, Pilate said to him, You will not speak to me. Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? And Jesus answered him, You would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. Therefore he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. From then on, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes him a king opposes Caesar. So when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat at a place called the Stone Pavement, and in Aramaic, Gabbatha. Now it's the day of preparation of the Passover, and it was about the sixth hour. He said to the Jews, Behold, your king, they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. And Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. So he delivered him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of a skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with two others, one on the other side, and Jesus between them, Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but rather this man said, I am the King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier, also his tunic. But the tunic was seamless, woven in one place from top to bottom. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, tear it but cast lots for it, to see whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture which says, they divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. So the soldiers did these things, but standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Clopas, 
and Mary Magdalene when Jesus saw his mother and said and, and the disciples whom he loved standing nearby he said to his mother woman behold your son and he said to the disciple behold your mother and from the hour the disciples took her to his own home after this Jesus knowing that all was now finished had to fulfill the scripture I thirst a jar full of sour wine stood there so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth when Jesus had received the sour wine he said it is finished and he bowed his head and gave up his his spirit since it was the day of preparation and saw that the bodies would not remain on the cross of the Sabbath for that Sabbath was a high day the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might might be broken and that they might be taken away so the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him but when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead they did not break his legs but one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and at once there came out blood and water he who saw it is born witness his testimony is true and he knows that he is telling the truth that you also may believe for these things took place that the scriptures might be fulfilled not one of his bones will be broken and again another scripture says they will look on him whom they have pierced after these things Joseph of Arimathea who was a disciple of Jesus but secretly for fear of the Jews asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus and Pilate gave him permission so he came and took away his body Nicodemus also who earlier had come to Jesus by night came bringing a mixture of mirth and aloes about 70 pounds in weight so they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloth with the spices as is the burial custom of the Jews and the place where he was crucified there was a garden and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid so because of the Jewish day of preparation since the tomb was close at hand they laid Jesus there and so the Lord rose from the dead and and then it comes here now Thomas in chapter 20 now Thomas one of the twelve called the twin was not with them when Jesus came so the other disciples told him we have seen the Lord but he said to them unless I see his hands and mark the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand in his side I will never believe eight days later his disciples were inside again and Thomas was with them although the doors were locked Jesus came and stood among them and said peace be with you then he said to Thomas put your finger here and see my hands Put your hands and place it into my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. And Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. The reason why I've spent so long tonight doing this um, video. Uh, it's a lengthy video I've done it's been four hours or more the reason why I wanted to do this video is I wanted you to see that that evangelicals when they say they believe in Jesus Christ is based on good scholarship we are not anti-intellectual and you can't get one of the one of the best you you, you, you can't have one of the best scholars around today is Dr. Borkham and I could have used many scholars but I just thought we'd concentrate on one tonight one world-class scholar who's done amazing work in historical research I've read um, a lot of the book and I've spent time looking at Borkham's quotes he mentioned ancient historians I would go and read the ancient historians and check it out so I've done detailed work going beyond Borkham's book reading ancient historical material 
to understand what Borkham's talking about. And so what I'm trying to communicate to you tonight is, as evangelicals, we are not anti-intellectual. Um, we want our faith to be based on evidence, and we will use the best scholarship. Now, we looked at, there were four scholars tonight that we saw. We saw um, Borkham, Crosley, Dr. Price, and Carrier. The atheist uh, Crosley at Sheffield University, who was talking to Borkham, is a very great was a very gracious atheist and was was one of the most educated, wise scholars of the atheist side. But the rest of the atheist group that's around today and their allies, people like Dr. Richard Carrier, are, are fringe scholars. And they're not taken seriously in the academic world. Dr. Price isn't taken seriously. But even when you actually sit down and you examine what they're saying, they're not actually basing what they're saying in any solid evidence. It's, it sounds really good, really powerful because it's good rhetoric, but there's no solidity to it. And I hope that you realize there's another side to these debates that you get. That there's another side of scholarship that you don't you're not getting as an atheist or skeptic or as a Muslim. And I would encourage you to make sure that you look at the other side in more detail. And if this podcast tonight or if this time tonight has encouraged you to read that book and to think about what Borkham is saying and to engage with it, then I would have done my job and, and that's what I hope to do tonight. Um, I've enjoyed, I've listened to Borkham's lectures and I, I read lots of other scholars in these subjects um, and you know I, I've read a lot of, of um, Borkham and you know I've given you notes on his book and, and um, I've got a lot of notes on him, and but I've got notes on other scholars. Um, we might do James Dunn, do four hours on him. Um, like I said, I don't agree fully with Borkham, but I'm just trying to show you that there is scholarship out there that verifies the Christian position, and it's solid scholarship. And um, I hope that you as an atheist realize that that even though you think you're smart on the historical quest for Jesus and did he rise from the dead, you're using old arguments that that are not relevant for today and lack any validity. That's what I think. So I hope it's given you a lot to think about anyway. And I'm going to close in prayer. And uh, thanks for st stopping by. Lord Jesus Christ, I thank you for this day, and I thank you for your love, and I thank you for your grace, and I give you the praise and glory. And Father, I just pray that you'd use this video for your glory, and I pray that you would use it, and that it be a major blessing to Christians, and those who uh, do not know you, Lord, may realize that they can read the Gospels, and realize there's eyewitness material there. We can know about you and who you are. So, Lord, we thank you in your name. Uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in these three on. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness and mercy. Be with all who hear this video tonight and who will continue to hear it. May they be blessed. May your Holy Spirit be with this video. And bless it to your glory, Lord, in your name. Amen. Amen. Um, copyright notice. All my videos from now on are only, the only people who have permission are born again Christians who will use the videos for their church work. So nobody else has any right to use these videos. If you see anybody using any of my videos pre-2014, uh, after 2013, so this new year, 2014, please flag them because they're not to be allowed to use these videos. A lot of atheists are using my videos trying to discredit me. 
um, they have a, a full channel where they try to discredit me and if you catch them with one of my videos that's made in this new year flag them and and uh, because they're not allowed to no, they, they have no right to copy any of my videos anymore um, I used to put my videos on Commons license but now it's on normal YouTube YouTube license and I expressively say in my video here that you have no right as atheists to use my video I do not give you the right and I actually do not give you the right to use any of my videos and I revoke my offer of letting people use them and you have no rights to use any of my videos and so you should take down those videos that you have because you're you, you're in breach of my rights uh, and you're involved in you're involved in cyberbullying basically uh, but that's I don't want to sour the video uh, of, 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 of what's been done tonight but I, I just really appreciate that you've come and you've listened to um, what's been said and I uh, hope to see you again I don't know whether I'll do a preaching one tomorrow or in the next day or two I can't give you a date for the next video but if you're a supporter of mine please watch my back there are some people out there who are really nasty some atheist groups uh, that are really nasty and they've really really been nasty to me over the Christmas period um, and just please watch my back if you catch them being nasty report them to YouTube uh, please um, just keep reporting them and maybe YouTube will continue to do something about them uh, I'm sorry to say that to you atheists uh, until you as a community learn to sort yourselves out and um, practice uh, stop abusing people um, then I have to say it, I don't want to say it, but until you stop abusing people, um, I have to say it, so there we are. So thanks for a lovely night, and I hope what you've had tonight is a blessing, and um, I wish you all the best. I do thank you for the few atheist friends that I have, I know there's one or two um, that do care about me, and I really appreciate that, and I thank you for the Christians who've come down to watch this video and I hope it does some good um, I hope it gets you thinking anyway and gets you when you when you I just want to say when you're debating an atheist I believe in presuppositional apologetics when you're debating an atheist or debating people presuppositional apologetics is brilliant but if the atheist or someone has questions you've got to give evidence you have to give some evidence so this kind of apologetics is important. It answers some of the questions that these critics bring up. All right. Take care and God bless you. Have a nice evening.